Hello, friends. I'm Paul Suda, and this is HEMA Mentors. Uh, with me today is Teresa Wendland, Dr. Teresa Wendland. Uh, she's a veterinarian who just finished her residency. Um, the reason that I'm talking to Teresa today, I mean, number one, she's a, a very accomplished um, fiorist, a fiore, a Italian a longsword and, and medieval martial arts scholar, but she's also an extremely accomplished equestrian. And not only that, but she's she's one of the people who has internationally even uh, been interpreting uh, mounted combat treatises from the Middle Ages and Renaissance. And something that I, that I that I'll tell people, you know, it's like it's like a it's deprecating and bragging at the same time. I'll tell people like lots of lots of folks are better fencers than me, and lots of folks are better uh, equestrians than me. Very few people of whom I'm aware are better at both of those things. And Teresa, you're one of those people. Um, so um, I'm really excited to talk to you. And we we know each other because um, I trained with um, with you and with Jesse Kula at, um, mm -hmm. at the Sword Play Guild, which is now, is Forteza fit, Fitness and CSG the same thing now? Okay. They're, they're not quite the same thing, but the CSG practices out of Forteza. Okay, so, so Forteza is sort of the business building and CSG is the organization. That, okay, great. Um, and we, we met in 2007 at the Western Martial mm -hmm. Arts Workshop, and I, I, I had moved to uh, the Chicago area. I moved to Chicago specifically to work at Medieval Times in Schaumburg. Put a pin in that because we'll talk about that a little bit. But the funny thing is, we're not we're kind of having a conversation now that we never quite had when we when we were kind of practicing or in, interacting in Chicago. Um, I'm I'm curious about your 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 journey as a martial artist and also as a equestrian. But but uh, so t tell us. I mean, first of all, fill in the blanks of your credentials that I that I didn't get to. Um, tell us about sort of what you've been up to lately, again, like, at, you know, professionally, but also, um, you know, uh, as brief an introduction as you can about your martial arts and equestrian background. Sure. So I guess I'll start with the equestrian, um, since that's my longest and oldest pursuit. Um, so I've actually been riding since I was about four years old. Um, my dad was an equestrian and uh, played polo and was a hunter jumper and he's actually the one who got me into it i think much to my mother's dismay um Why is I, that? <laughs> I think she just didn't like the idea of me getting on a big strong horse and then of course you know when i was um i think a teenager there was christopher reeves accident and she had another fit at my father um so uh but it's it's a little bit of a family pursuit on that side my sister is an equestrian as well um, so, uh, come to it pretty naturally. Um, I've done kind of the gamut of English writing. So I started at a dressage barn when I was a little kid, when I first started learning to ride. Um, when I was probably about 12, I started getting into some hunter jumper, um, pursuits and then also a little bit of eventing. Um, and that's actually when I got my first horse, Shabance. Um, I was 13 at that time, and um, he actually is the horse that ended up helping me to learn uh, equestrian martial arts because he was just kind of that horse that grew up with me, and so he was used to us doing all kinds of crazy business. Um, you you trust each other, basically, right? Really, yeah, and so it, it made the whole process a lot easier. Um, but I, I did find my way back to dressage. Um, I should clarify more of a uh, competitive dressage background than, than classical or Baroque. Um, and then eventually in studying uh, the manuscripts, started having a better understanding of where a more classical approach to dressage or even a Baroque pr uh, approach to dressage might have its benefits, um, working equitation as well. So uh, that's sort of my brief background in riding. Um, I still have one horse. Uh, Shabance unfortunately passed away about a month and a half ago now. So I, I just lost him at the ripe old age of almost 30 years old. Um, Sorry to hear about that. That's that's sad, but 30 is not bad. That's not a bad age to get to as a horse. Yeah, and he, he led the, quite the life. So um, I won't get into that because that was, it was pretty hard, but um, but I still do have my horse. His name is King. Um, he's actually a retired thoroughbred, never made it to the racetrack, um, but kind of a short stocky build for a, a thoroughbred and um, we do dressage. So. Um, and the shorter build is better, right, for dressage? 
I think it is. I like a little bit more compact build in my horses. I know in a lot of competitive dressage right now, um, people tend to go for the big, tall, leggy, warm bloods. Um, but mm. for what we do in medieval martial arts um, and a little bit more of a classical build tends to be that shorter, stockier look. Now, the, 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 the sort of analog would be it has a, like a shorter wheelbase. Yes. Yeah, I think they're a little bit more maneuverable. They can they can turn on a dime. They can collect themselves a little bit better. So a, a shorter back, um, broader, stronger haunches actually uh, better allows the horse to get their hind end underneath them to help propel. So for what we do, it's absolutely an advantage in my opinion. Now, and, and as kind of as we talk about these things, I might stop you or have you clarify concepts that I mean. There's a chance I don't understand them, so this is very sneaky. But there's also a, there's a, a bigger chance again if, if people who are watching this have a Western martial arts or HEMA background, um, but they aren't equestrians, they might not quite know what you mean. So let's first ex first explain to 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 our audience, not to me. I know everything. Explain to the audience uh, what's the difference. What what is dressage? What is eventing? Hunting? Jumping? I mean, the, the different kinds of training that you could expect to find um, in the modern North American, at least, equestrian world. Sure. I'll try to give a, a pretty basic. Um, yeah, yeah. You don't need to go into great detail because, again, you'll lose. You might even lose me. So just do your best. <laughs> So dressage would be working primarily on the flat, on the, um, on the ground, so it doesn't involve jumping. Um, and what you're really looking for is movement and athleticism of that horse um, and trying to achieve collection, which means engaging the core. So as, as martial artists, I think that's where we really have a, a good understanding um, because you're asking those horses, to use their abdominal muscles and to ride or to rise into the rider's seat. So the, the back comes up and supports them and they put their haunches underneath them a little bit and they have almost a rounded appearance. So that's when you see those horses with the beautiful rounded neck, the nose just a little bit you know, forward. You don't want them sucked back. You want them just, but where they're a little bit more vertical. Um, and that means that they're, they're, we call it on the bit. Some people don't like that term, um, but you're driving from behind. Um, and those horses, because they're driving for, from behind, again, very much like the martial artist, they become light on their feet because they're stabilized in the core and they can move sideways. They can turn, um, they can transition from gate to gate very easily. Um, and that's where, I really enjoy it because I think that there's a lot of finesse. There's a lot of a horse's natural athleticism that really lends itself to the, these nuances that come out in dressage. And, and that really lends itself to martial arts. Um, hunter jumper, it's, it's really fun. So hunter is a little bit more about class and style and um, getting over the jumps in a, with a certain look, whereas jumper is kind of, you know, as fast as you can get through the course without knocking bars, getting over high jumps. It's really fast paced and exciting. Um, and then eventing is a combination of disciplines. And so you have your stadium jumping, um, you have a cross country course. So meaning going over different terrains, different obstacles. So water, um, fixed jumps like logs or, or walls, um, a things lot that more... won't, things that won't collapse when you hit them, like actual yeah. obstacles that you could hit and hurt yourself on or, or fall oh, onto. Sure. Yeah. It's, uh, it's fun. It's a little scary. It's an adrenaline rush, but it's, it is really fun. And it takes definitely a lot of, again, a lot of athleticism from that horse. Um, and then, uh, eventing that third event is dressage. So that is demonstrating, um, again, just that, that control and, and restraint in those horses as well. So um, that was the appeal of, of eventing is it kind of covers all of those different venues. But um, for me, as much as I like to cast a, a broad stroke or broad brush um, over the things that I do, I like to do a lot of different things. Um, it, it felt better to me to focus on one discipline. To me, there's so much to learn about dressage. In an entire lifetime, you're never, you're never going to be a true expert. I mean, it's always a process of learning and learning with the individual horses you're working with. So that's why I chose to focus on that. And, and uh, for the disciplines you just described, all of them essentially use an English saddle. Is that right to assume? Mm -hmm. 
more or less. Um, di there's different styles of saddles even within each of those disciplines, but right. So when we talk about English versus Western um, for our less equestrian inclined folks, um, big Western saddle would just be with the horn on the front. They tend to be a little bit uh, bulkier. They're meant to be able to sit in that saddle all day long. Originally, you know, it's, it's meant for being out on the range, moving cattle. It's a very secure seat. Um, where it comes up in the front and the back, it has big broad stirrups and there's a lot of protection between your leg and that horse. Um, whereas an English saddle, uh, depending on the discipline, can be extremely minimalist. So dressage saddles may be a little bit more built up, but it, it is designed to have very close contact with that horse. You don't have a big pommel in front, you have just a little bit of cantle in the back, um, but you can feel the horse with your legs. Um, jumper saddles, some of them are really small and you're really sitting up and your feet are, are high in those stirrups because you have to be able to get up off of the horse's back to get over the jumps. Um, so that's kind of the difference. Uh, once we actually get into some of the historic pursuits of, of equestrianism and we get into some of the martial arts aspects, we, we get into a very different style of saddle um, that has a high pommel, a high cantle, maybe even sits a little bit higher off of the horse's back. Um, so you take a more narrow stance when sitting atop um, some of these very broad horses. Um, and it does affect the way that you ride. Um, some of those saddle styles are actually described in a little bit uh, later manuscript, Dom Duarte. Um, and that's a really great reference, I think, for coming out of um, some of the, the slightly later period um, that we're, we're looking at with these martial arts. Well, and my impression of the different kinds of saddle is, is, is it's basically a trade-off. If you want, if the saddle is smaller, then you have more contact with the horse. There's, there are more ways to communicate more with, with less energy with the horse, yes? Mm -hmm. in, yeah, in short. And that, if a, a, a bigger saddle makes it more difficult to give the horse subtle cues with your legs, even though, again, you, your, your posture is always going to be something, you know, that affects that communication. But, but with a bigger saddle, it's more difficult to give really subtle cues with your legs. But, you're, but, but it's more merciful in terms of if your balance isn't perfect, maybe you don't fall out of the saddle. Is that reasonable to say? Yeah, it's, it's more secure. I'm sure that somebody on here is probably listening and they do reining, um, which is a Western pursuit that's a, a Western discipline that is very subtle and it's actually very much akin to dressage in a lot of ways. Um, I'm sure they're arguing that point that they feel like they've got excellent contact and, and communication with their horse. So I'm sure my opinion is a little bit biased. I'm personally more comfortable in, a, in an English saddle and I feel like I have more close communication and contact with the horse. That's my interpretation of it, but I'm also not an expert in those other types of saddles. Sure, well, and it seems, again, the, to kind of circle back around, the, the parallel that I think is useful to draw between um, medieval martial arts or any martial art in general and horseback riding is what you, you're describing um, using a certain discipline to get a certain kind of physical movement out of a horse that that is good body mechanically but isn't necessarily instinctive. Yes? Yes and no. Um, I actually do think that a lot of what we are asking of those horses, you can actually see them performing when they're out in pasture. Um, mm. When a horse actually gets really excited, um, you can see a stallion, for example, showing off for a mare, and they tend to take that very rounded, kind of puffed up position in their body and, and they get a little bit more prancy, they'll collect underneath themselves, um, they will, rear up on their haunches a little bit and, and turn. Um, they'll cross over their legs. Um, actually a horse, when it spooks, it's really funny, will we'll do a perfect um, half pass away from, uh, yeah, where they're, they're crossing over and, and turning um, while kind of moving in a straight line to kind of avoid whatever threat is over there. So I think that we, we really are harnessing some of those natural instincts, um, but we just have to teach it to a cue. I mean, some things maybe aren't, aren't quite as natural as others, but I, I think that most of what we're asking them to do is something that's in their movement vocabulary. Well, that's fair enough. But I think the, what, what, I, what I also kind of meant was um, 
if their weight is too far forward, that's dangerous for both the horse and the rider. Yes. Yes. Um, well, so they're, yeah, I guess if they, if they're hollowing out their back, they're not supporting the rider. They're not pushing as much from the back. I don't know if it's as much dangerous, but in the long term, it's, it's not very good for their back. Um, it tends not to be as good for their mechanics. Um, and they may not be as responsive to the rider's cues. So in that sense, it can be a little bit more dangerous for sure. Um, a horse, so this is where actually my veterinary background comes in a little bit more. Um, doing what I do, I actually study movement and the way structure works and, and how that comes across as function. Um, I don't do it for horses, I do it for canines. Um, but it's, uh, there's a lot of crossover. It's so still a four-legged four creature that has different gates it can move in. Yeah. A horse, um, similar to a dog as well, carries its weight um, much more in the front end. Um, they have to support their neck. They have to support their head. They have very large shoulder structures. Um, so about 60% of that horse's body weight is actually carried on the front end and less weight is carried in that hind end. And so in asking them to shift that weight back, we actually are asking for a little bit of a, a change, but the hind end, because there's more flexion to those, um, or angles to that hind end, they have a lot more power. They have their Achilles tendon, um, which is kind of a powerhouse complex uh, back there. They've got huge muscles in their glutes and in their hamstrings, um, and that allows them to push, whereas the front end is very upright. It's actually a little bit more akin to, if you look at it, a human's legs, where our knees are kind of locked out and, and we stand up very straight. So they don't have as much pushing power from the front end. So that front end provides that um, pivoting power and steering, and, and the hind end is really, uh, they've got some good hind end torque. It's like a rear wheel uh, drive car. <laughs> It's cool hearing you talk about things like this. Um, so, um, so that I think that's a fine beginning for your equestrian background. When when did you encounter historical European martial arts, and, and or when did you decide that was something you wanted to do? Or I mean, or did you have other interests? I mean, up to and including equestrian that made that proclivities that made you susceptible to being interested in this stuff. For sure. Um, I've always been a bit of a history nerd. Okay. Uh, when I was a kid, I loved reading books. I actually loved costuming. And I got really into originally, this is going to sound really dorky, um, Elizabethan costuming in part because of the Bristol Renaissance Fair. Um, mm. I just have a, a memory of falling in love with the court outfits at Bristol. And they're one of the Renaissance fairs that actually always did a really nice job, at least in the past. I, I haven't been there for many years. Um, but in the past, their court actually had very historically accurate um, Elizabethan costuming. And it's, it's taken a big turn from that. Um, but it got me interested in actually reading about that. And I started sewing and um, doing a lot of costuming, even when I was maybe, you know, five, six years old with my grandma and my, my aunt, and they started to teach me. And uh, then when I was around 11 or 12, actually in middle school, I started uh, making costumes for my friends. And we did like fairy costumes and we did princess costumes. And um, it was, oh, what, I can't even remember what it was called, but it was um, like a Cinderella, spinoff that came out and it was Italian Renaissance costuming. And oh. so that was a big inspiration for uh, a lot of things for me. So that was kind of my early nerdy history background. Um, we would make stupid movies and I was really into swords and fencing. Even back then we would take the, the driveway um, markers, you know, my, my mom hated it, but it would be like the fiberglass and plastic driveway markers and we'd be fencing and everybody's worried you're gonna put an eye out. Um, so making movies, you know, little homemade movies and things like that. Um, and then I got into a little bit of martial arts as a kid. Um, I did some hop keto. Um, and then I started working with some friends who were learning kendo, but it wasn't really what I was looking for. Um, I really wanted to play with 
European swords. Um, so I ended up finding the Chicago Sword Play Guild actually when I was in college. I was going to art school at the time. I, I have a background actually in sculpture originally. Um, and I found my way to the community college intro class that the CSG was putting on um, and started that when I was, gosh, I think I was 18 at the time, maybe 19. Um, and it was exactly what I was looking for. It was everything I hoped for, even though it was, you know, at that time we were using wooden wasters and um, eventually it was really, you know, it was really cool when we got the big sheen eye that we, uh, we made guards for and pommels. Um, but I remember my first fencing night, they were these big, they looked like padded tongue depressors. And it was very similar to, um, I actually forgot a step. I, I played a little dagger here with my uh, high school and college friends, which is um, boffer fighting. It was like- oh, Okay, all right, no, I've fighting. heard about that. And actually some, some, of my, some of my Medieval Times pals have been involved in stuff like that. I mean, and actually even some of, some of my HEMA colleagues in the LA area like that stuff, or, or, they, or they'll, they'll, they'll They'll do LARP and they'll do the Boffer League stuff. I mean, some people just do, they just fight all the time. And not, then I wonder why they beat the shit out of me when we actually bow. It's like, oh, you're just, <laughs> I, might, I get it now. That's okay. awesome. Yeah, I, I forgot to mention that little piece. So it was not forgot, just something sure. like that, but we actually, <laughs> you know, putting a little technique behind it. But man, those things, those things packed a punch. Um, I remember the first time I got hit really hard in the head and I felt like such a girl. It didn't hurt, but I couldn't stop crying. It was like this weird reaction of just being hit in the, the head. And it, Was it your nose? I, the the, the no, kick of the nose? Huh. I, was, I was in a helmet and I was just seeing stars because I get hit so hard. I'm like, I want to keep fencing. And, you know, like tears are streaming down my face. I'm like, are you okay? I'm like, I'm fine. I don't actually know why I'm crying. <laughs> <laughs> Just like, um, I'm not crying, you're crying. Let's go. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so it took a, took a couple big hits, and then I was like, all right, we're good. Um, so that was a really fun start. And then I actually, uh, after going through that intro course, integrated into the CSG, and it's all history from there. So I went through CSG. Actually, while I was finishing up art school, I went and did a internship at Arms and Armor uh, for a summer. Um, because I did sculpture and, and metal sculpture, I actually got to make daggers and sword parts and lived in a church in uh, Minneapolis for a little bit. Okay, I was gonna ask where that where, that, where they're based, I forgot about yeah, that. Yeah, Minneapolis. Um, that was super fun. Um, so actually one of my cutting swords is one that I actually um, <laughs> furnished when I was there. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, it's, it's an Angus trim blade, but um, I made all of the hardware for it and sharpened it up a little bit and, and altered it a little bit for me and it's, it's still my favorite cutting sword so it's, it's kind of awesome that I, I put that together so um let's see and then after after some time with the csg i ended up moving to colorado um in 2011 um for a number of personal reasons um but also in part because i was applying to veterinary school um, and so I was finishing up some prerequisites, uh, actually working on a microbiology degree at the time and um, ended up getting to veterinary school in Colorado. So I moved up to Fort Collins, but when I was uh, in Denver, I started working with the Rocky Mountain Sword Play Guild um, and worked with them for years. Um, I've honestly been on a little bit of a hiatus the last two years. Um, for a lot of reasons, but in part just because life is super busy, doing a medical residency is pretty intense. Um, so here I am, I'm, I'm feeling a little out of the game right now. Uh, so I, so it kind of, it's funny, it's a little odd timing, I get, not odd timing, but for an interview like this, just because I feel like, gosh, I, I hope I even remember what I'm talking about. <laughs> I've been so inundated in medical study and books. Um, so I, I shifted some of my, my physical pursuits actually more towards um, bodybuilding just because it's something that I can do with the time that I have without having to travel and, and work with other people's schedules. Yeah, I'll actually ask more about your physical fitness, um, I'd say a little later, because I actually want to ask, I mean, and again, even, even though you're sort of, you, you're because of life getting in the way, you've sort of stepped away from a lot of the practice. I still am curious about um, about your routines, um, 
you know, around practice and also around physical fitness. But I'd say let's let's actually put that a little later. Um, the, the question that I have actually, um, now that you've kind of gone through kind of where you've been with and sort of the, the broad strokes of the journey, are there, are there like personal orthodoxies of yours that have shifted dramatically in this? And you, you could talk about this as a, as an equestrian and also as a martial artist. I'm curious about both. Like since you've started, what are the biggest things that you think about or feel about differently now than, than other points during your career? Gosh, that's a, that's a hard question. Um, you know, it's, it's funny, whenever you start something, there's always this little bit of a blissful ignorance in the beginning, and I think you have no idea how much you don't know. Um, and I actually feel like a big turning point for me, actually, even in my riding, was martial arts because it gave me a much better understanding of movement, physicality, structure, and I was able to apply that back to my riding. And then that took an even bigger turn when I actually started historical European martial arts um, because I now had a reason to also apply that to the riding. It was pretty early on when at the CSG, my friends there discovered that I was also a rider and then they introduced me to the manuscripts. Um, I think I was still in that intro class when I started nerding out over the equestrian section. So um, that was also a big time of, of change and shift and, and looking really critically at how I was riding, how I was training, um, what are the possibilities, you know, what, what do I actually need from, my, what do I need to ask from my horse, how do I need to train myself, um, and then since that time, and that really evolved, I, I spent quite a bit of time actually in Germany with a good friend of mine, uh, Julia Tut, uh, who's now in Switzerland, she's originally Swiss, um, and I learned so much from her. She, she is such an accomplished equestrian rider and trainer. She actually got her start in more of a, a theatrical approach to mounted combat, but she since has also done a lot of research and, and serious work on, um, work looking at the manuscripts and, um, incorporating fighting into her riding. So she was not quite as much of a martial artist to start, but, um, uh, definitely an amazing equestrian. Um, and then a, a really humbling time for me was uh, when I actually got to go back to Germany and went to uh, Bukeborg and met Arne Kutz in person. Um, he's another just absolutely amazing rider and jouster and he's a martial artist. And he's probably done, I think, some of the best research, you know, to date that we have on, um, mono combat and I could only hope you know to ever be even half as good as he is um but I had the opportunity to work with some other horses there I rode a couple of horses and we got to do uh some melee scenarios and I was you know got to work with their amazing um Spanish and Portuguese horses um, so, uh, the horse that I was riding when we were uh, doing some melee scenarios was Lusitano. Um, absolutely amazing. The power that I just never had even really experienced before. The, the horses that we have in America and that I had ridden, completely different. Um, you know, I worked with some more warm bloods, with thoroughbreds, doing dressage, but actually getting to sit on these highly trained Iberian type horses was amazing and I also realized where I had some major holes in my riding training um, just because they were so cued into such subtle changes in seat and weight um, so that was that was a really amazing paradigm shift for me and and how I needed to move forward in my training when I went home um, so that was really big um, now honestly like I said, I, I feel a little remiss because I've been out of the game and um, I honestly haven't even been riding very much because of my time constraints and um, 
my horse Chabance, as I mentioned, he's retired at this point. My horse King got a little bit of a break. He's kind of a pasture pet for a little bit just because I've had to refocus my energies and in, um, in my career. So um, I, I hope that's what you're looking for. <laughs> no, no, absolutely. That was very useful. And actually, what I want to what I want to back up with um, that was a good segue into. Um, something that, again, a lot of laymen or even historical martial arts types might not understand is um, that there are, just like dog breeds, there are horse breeds that are relatively new and there's horse breeds that are relatively old. And um, I understand Lusitanos and Andalusians, which are you know, the you know, Iberian horses, um, they're pretty old breeds, yes? Yeah, they come from very, very old bloodlines. Um, and if, you know, we're going back to talking horse body types, um, I think, you know, looking at the way that they are built and then looking at the horses that actually are appearing in Fiore and some of the, the German manuscripts, they are much closer to that. Oh, well, I guess in Fiore, we, we've got almost you know, shorter, almost pony looking types, but I guess in more of the, the German manuscripts, um, they're pretty closely akin to that build where they're a little bit shorter in build, shorter in body, very thick necks, uh, very muscular shoulders and, and hind quarters. Um, I mean, they are built to collect their bodies and to drive from behind and, and to just be able to turn on a dime. And, um, the interesting thing to me also, again, I think this is a, to a great degree a result of not only what equestrian culture has turned into now, but also um, the, the sort of anachronistic fumes we're kind of inhaling when we read about the Middle Ages, like Victorian anachronisms, but not even that, but the, even the, the Tudor era anachronisms of, you know, the the horses you might ride that would be a good medieval horse for really fighting or being in a melee in a tournament, that isn't necessarily the same horse you'd want to be riding if you were jousting, for right. example. Yeah, um, I think, oh, hang on, I'm sorry. No, wait, no big deal. Okay, back. <laughs> um, yeah, so different horses for different pursuits, absolutely. And that's very much true even for, um, modern day horse sports. So, um, you know, a, a jumper is different than a race horse is different than a reigning horse. Um, it, it really depends on what you're doing with that animal. And so for a melee, maybe you want a little bit smaller horse who's going to be able to move quickly on its feet, be able to turn quickly and maneuver for you. And in jousting, you know, I, I want to clarify really quickly that in, in those times, we did not have huge horses. I mean, all of the evidence that exists on, on the horse breeds um, during the 14th, 15th, 16th centuries points towards much smaller horses than what's depicted in movies. I mean, I think people have this idea, and I, I think it's been dispelled pretty strongly over the years, but um, draft type horses, and, and it's that image of the big Clydesdale or Belgian type horse you know, barreling down the list um, that I think we just need to still try to get out of that, that image in pop culture. Um, yes, you want a heavier horse who can handle the shock of a, a hard hit um, when you're jousting, but that doesn't mean that that horse has to be 18, 19, 20 hands tall. It just means, um, and a hand is four inches for, for everybody else. Um, so 18, 18 hands is, is six feet tall at their shoulder, yes? Yeah. yeah, and so we measure to the top of the withers, which is the top of the shoulder blade. Cool. Um, so that, or not the top of the shoulder blade, it's like where the, the spine comes up, but it, it looks like the top of the shoulder blade at the base of the neck. Yeah, so um, I mean, but, but if, they're, if they're 18 hands at, at that point, if they really stretch up and they have their head above that, then they're considerably taller than even that, you know, at the top of, you know, whatever the top of, top part of the horse is standing there. It's pretty imposing. Right. That's a huge horse. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, wait, this is a good... Hmm? Oh, I would say, I don't want to fall off of that personally. But that's just me. <laughs> this, is a, this is a good time for me to tell you. I don't know if I told you this story. I got hired. I got fucking taken. I got hired by a, um, a uh, 
a barn owner at the LA Equestrian Center when I first moved to LA. Um, and, and actually, I, it might have been like a third degree referral from, from the, the folks you introduced me to at Del Mar in the first place. So thanks for this. Um, Sorry. <laughs> but no, 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 it, it's no. Um, I got hired, I think, because this horse had hurt like two other trainers. Um, okay. this, it was a, an 18 hand Percheron that weighed probably a ton. And he wasn't like, he wasn't malicious, but he was super lazy and his owner was really, really terrible at reinforcing good habits. So I'd get on this guy and try to exercise him and try to insist. And I got, you know, I, I could be pretty aggressive and I actually regret being as aggressive sometimes as I was in that case. But it was funny. Uh, and he took, he took me for rides and it was really embarrassing and dangerous. Um, but uh, the, the time that I got thrown, this is the only time I've actually been thrown, like really thrown and like, you know, flew through the air like Christopher Reeve, um, was he wasn't even, he wasn't even being dirty. He just hadn't been turned out in two days. And they didn't tell me that before I got on him and took him to exercise. So we're in this round pen, this, you know, this like enclosed, you know, uh, roofed round pen at, at the equestrian center, again, flat arena. Okay, not super deep sand, but sand and concrete around the edges. Um, and I was warming him up and without any warning, he just picks up his back legs and rounds his back. And I was, it was, you know, I just found myself like a ragdoll in the air. And, you know, luckily, cause I, you know, luckily because of all the medieval time stunt falls, right. you know, I get thrown and I'm in the air. I'm like, well, that's in the past. I can't do anything about that now. So Touch I should probably, I should, I should probably, <laughs> when I hit the ground, not break my neck and roll to the right. So he doesn't trample me. And it was, it was like slow motion, those thoughts. And then everything sped up again. Yep. And I, you know, and I, I managed to get out of the way and I, I popped my feet and he was already like running away. He was like, I messed up. I, you know, I had to chase him across mm -hmm. half the damn place. And, you know, some trainer was holding his reins, looking very, you know, like disdainfully at me. Oh, he throw you. <laughs> Interesting. Um, but um, yeah, that wasn't good. 18 hands is a long way to fall, especially if you go up before you go down. Um, yeah. So okay. Enough. I've never fallen off of a horse that big. I think I think I topped out at like a 17 one thoroughbred with uh, with being thrown. And you know what? Maybe it doesn't matter how high, because one of my worst falls was actually off of a 14 hand pony. Um, man, I, that was a scenario where I think I got taken similarly mm -hmm. uh <laughs> they didn't was, tell you the truth no not at all so i was uh looking to just ride a horse because my horse was laid up at the time from an injury and um they said hey we've got this horse he's a little challenging but i think he'd be a really great uh ride for you i'm like sure yeah why not I'm like yeah his owner actually um got hurt a little while ago so she's still recovering i can't ride so um here he's all yours what I didn't find out <laughs> until I started working with him for some time is that the reason the owner was hurt is because he broke her back. Well, so, how did, he do that? Did, he, did he flip over on her? Oh, he, he threw her really badly into uh, a wall. And it wasn't like a fun little, hey, we're just going to freak out and she couldn't stay on. It was like a, hey, lady, get off my back. and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get you off of my back. Um, he, it took him quite some time to actually finally throw me, but that was a little, you know, crow hop down the side of the arena with a pop in the air, like popcorn and twist. And oh, so like mo most of the tricks they can pull on you, short of flipping over and hurting themselves. Pretty much, Oof. yeah. Oh, uh, another another one. Um, th actually, this again, this this in this case, it wasn't actually dirty. The horse was, per was the horse was great, but uh, it had rained and there was one like muddy section of the track. Uh, you know, and he was a. Uh, he was a Western horse, um, I think like cutting, reining horse. Um, again, bit like lovely, kind of old, but like a very easy horse to ride and exercise. And I was, I was working uh, as an assistant to one of the trainers at the Flipmage Riding Club. And it was actually a good experience. I learned quite a bit from her. Um, but anyway, it was, it, was, it was muddy in one section, so he just wiped out and, and he, 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 uh, he kind of ate shit and tumbled over his right shoulder. And he, 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 to his credit, he stopped himself from actually rolling, rolling. So I managed to get out of there, and I only kind of got my one foot smushed under his weight. And luckily, because because it was muddy, you know, the, mm -hmm. the mud gave so, so I didn't like have my total ankle smushed and shredded. I, it took like two weeks to get better instead of you know way longer. So I got very lucky, even though that was not a good spill. You know, like mud from 
you know, here all the way to my boot. <laughs> but not a good time. <laughs> um, no. oh, the, the asterisk I have to put on again uh, to add to the, the jousting horses sort of question. Um, oh, yeah. I, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, because I, I just want to add this because I, I don't want I don't want to kind of go by the wayside is, again, I, I'm not a super experienced jouster, but I was in the damn jousting TV show. And one thing that we did establish during that whole process was, um, generally speaking, yes, a little heavier is not bad, but but shorter, if, you're, if your horse is shorter than your opponent's horse and or if you're shorter, if you're basically if you're on a lower platform than your opponent and you hit them in the right place, it's like you're uppercutting them out of yeah. their stirrups. Lifting them up so, and out of their stirrups. So even, so even though like there was a few times when I was riding like taller horses, even if they were like, he even if they were heavy and fast and were like had the right mindset, I still didn't really feel comfortable using them for a, a competitive joust because because I'm tall, it's already likely I'm going to be on a higher platform than my opponent. And like, unlike foot martial arts, I can't just bend my knees and get shorter. I have to, I'm stuck. I'm stuck at whatever level I'm at. So, you know, if I'm going to get uppercutted, I'd, ra I'd rather do my very best to level or lower. You know, it's like, it's, yeah. it's again, it's a, one of those weird parallel principles that <laughs> once you see it play out in a different way, you're like, oh, that, 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 that's a cross disciplinary principle that I should not ignore. <laughs> Right. And gosh, you know, you keep bringing up so many points that I think we, we need to circle back to at some point. So I'll just grab onto one and yeah, go. Yeah, grab one. Just go. Um, yeah, there's no, there's no format. <laughs> I, uh, I've also only just dabbled in jousting. So I don't have a lot of jousting experience. Um, I uh, participated in lists on the lake with Steve Hempel uh, quite a while ago. Um, did a little bit of uh, work when I was in Germany. And then um, my ex, who's actually still a good friend of mine, Douglas Wagner, uh, did actually get more into jousting. And so I did help him with his jousting training some, um, learned quite a bit from him as well, since he went a, a lot deeper into that. And um, what I did learn, because we did a lot of target practice during that time as well, is you need to be very careful about how you lower your lance. And, you're at a distinct disadvantage when you are taller and you have to drop that lance below parallel because you no longer are able to stabilize that lance as well when it's pointing down. And you have to get that timing just right because if you dip too low and you have to lift it back up, you're kind of losing losing that flow and you're losing your opportunity to aim really well. You're also potentially you know, at greater risk of, of hitting a horse, which is a huge no-no, um, or having interference with horse legs or, or something like that. Um, Bad form at the very least. Bad form. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so I think it is really helpful when you have similarly sized horses in those scenarios, or if you are the little guy in that scenario, because you actually don't even have to move that lance quite as far and you have that leverage ability. Well, it's even, it's even worse than that. Again, uh, you know, it, this, this is anecdotal, but it's not that anecdotal because uh, so many of the experienced judges I interacted with had something, some variation of this issue um, in the match in which I was knocked out, eliminated from the competition, um, I was against uh, Josh Knowles, who actually was a colleague of mine. He, he, he helped train me up in Myrtle Beach. He was one of the people who helped train me to ride and to, and to do these stage fights. And then he's just like, he's a scary guy. He was, he was he's my height and he was probably 245, you know, at the time, which I'm, I'm heavier than I used to be, but he's, he was quite a bit heavier than I was. And we both hit each other at the same time and both went flying. And what happened with me when that happened is we both hit the sweet spot, like, you know, like right about right here, like kind of right on the top corner of that grand guard target, you know, license plate thing. And we both just went. Whew. Um, but what happened to me when that happened was I was gripping the lance really hard and I was holding it a little, little bit away from my body, um, which the advantage of that is, if, if the lance isn't connected to your body, you can steady it. You know, you can kind of um, offset the motion of the horse that could make your, you know, make your aim a little bit shaky. But when I hit him, from the, from the instant it hit him until, until the lance went down and braced itself against my, my breastplate, it was just all of his weight and all of my weight slamming into my shoulder joint. 
So, I mean, I didn't dislocate my shoulder. My, my rotator cuff miraculously ended up being fine. But every, every connector at the, in the front and top of my shoulder was explosively stretched. And it took me six months to get my range of motion back and another six to get most of my strength back. And it still hurts sometimes. So like, you know, I mean, the, the specialist I was talking to who was kind of helping me, you know, like rehab it and wake it up and what have you. Um, he was like, oh, this is basically like you punched a car before it hit you at 40 miles per hour. It's pretty much what happened to your shoulder. Um, yeah. So that, I mean, having, having, you know, really having that connection to your body and then the horse, even if it ends with you flying off the horse, the ch- if your arm is good, you know, it, it's not great to get you know, slammed off of a horse, but, right. it, but, but it's, it's even worse to get slammed off the horse. And one of your not so strong joints takes most of that force before the rest of you does not good. And again, m- multiple professional jest- jester types that I've interacted with had chronic or acute shoulder problems all the time. Yeah. Well, I think that makes sense. I mean, again, as you so aptly pointed out, you have the power of the horse behind you. And especially if you're doing this the right way, and you are really connected to that horse and you're using their stride in that correct moment as well. It just adds that much more power to the hit. Whether you're doing wrestling, swordsmanship, jousting, um, whatever, whatever that may be, you are able to use that horse to generate so much power. It is absolutely ridiculous. And now in a jousting situation or you know, horse on horse situation, you just you create a really explosive moment when, when that hit actually does happen. This is actually a great segue. So it, um, something you said more than once when you were really getting into the, the mounted manuals and trying to interpret and, and work them out as best in as safe a environment as you could, something you said to me more than once was that um, it's especially as a, you know, you're, you're a, a strong athletic person, but like, but you're, you're not some giant brute. You're a, you know, a, a female of a reasonable weight um, and power. Mm-hmm. Um, when you, what you told me was that the great thing about doing martial arts connected to a horse is that the horse equalizes the power differential. Is that correct? I think in a lot of ways it does. I mean, it's, it's hard to overcome massive size differences no matter what um you know my my upper body strength is a lot greater than it even was then so i'd be curious what i you know what i can do now but um (laughs) (laughs) i can bench over 200 pounds now so uh (laughs) um but yeah you're absolutely right in that you know when you're looking at a thousand pound or a 1200 pound animal or let's call it like a 500 kilo animal and now you're looking at a human who's 140 pounds versus 200 pounds that that 60 pounds is absolutely negligible and so it comes down to who is better able to work with their horse and who has better biomechanics and who has better structure um, because that 60 pounds really is like a, a drop in the bucket at that point in time um, well, and the, I mean, th- this is a great parallel to foot martial arts or any martial arts is the question is who is in the better position and generating power in the correct direction at the moment of contact? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, for sure. Um, and I think that that is amplified with the equestrian arts. So I guess I'll clarify that um, and just go into a little bit of where a lot of my focus and in, in studying uh, equestrian martial arts came from. And that was how do we time hits? How do we best use that horse as our legs? Because that's essentially what we're having to do. Um, you know, I think that in movies, we see people running at each other on a battlefield, screaming wildly and flailing and, and knocking each other off of horses as they crash into each other. And, and sure, there is a, you know, there are cavalry tactics that, that involve um, formation and hard hitting, just running. But I think that there's a lot more to it, especially if you're looking at, um, like, say, the judicial combat, uh, one-on-one scenarios, if you look at um, when the cavalry breaks down and you have more of a one-on-one type scenario and you you end up having to realize how that horse needs to be 
your legs and they can move very similarly to the way that we do when we are fencing with each other and we just have to understand how to use that. We cover more ground, there's probably more steps in between, but we have to be able to, again, similarly to fighting on foot, work in 365 degrees. Um, it's or 360 degrees, not 65. Um, <laughs> We, it's, it's in the round, uh, you know, with fencing, with uh, modern sport fencing, there's a lot more linear moving forward and back. Um, but with WMA or HEMA, you really do have to learn to step off of the line and to triangulate on your opponent because you need to get to their opening and you need to get across their structure. Um, you know, we, we always talk about triangles, waves, um, and using body structure um, to, to move someone and how do you best then do that with the horse? How do you use that horse to create that wave and that spiral that you're going to put through your opponent's body? And that's where I think collection comes in. So coming back to that early concept that we were talking about, getting the horse to sit back on their haunches, you can actually feel where they are in that stride because it slows down their motion considerably. And what you know, what you want to do is you want to time your contact with your opponent, whether that's with weapons or bare hands. Similarly to as you are stepping, um, you don't want to be caught, you know, on your rear foot and, and already toppling backwards. You want to be already into your stride and stepping into that hit. And so similarly with the horse, when we collect them and we ask them to move forward in that way, we try to time our contact that we can use that forward motion of the horse's body. And as they're even rising into that step to catch your opponent, because that, that yeah, allows like the uppercut, that, that wave motion that, yeah, the uppercut. Or, or, so or like, or like grab, grab and throw. Absolutely. And it, especially if, if you're working in these saddles that have these really high pommels and cantles, um, you're looking at a couple different things. You're either looking at turning someone where they're stuck and you're now cranking their spine and, and you're kind of pulling them, or if you're able to catch them in the right way, you can almost pull them up and out of that saddle and, and actually create a throw. Like up, back, um, up and backwards, probably? Up and backwards and a little bit to the side. So you're not going to go straight over because remember with the horses, we never have a head-to-head -head meeting. You have to it's be... Always you can't awesome. reach them unless you're unless you're going by them either either opposite or parallel. Correct. And so yeah. we're actually coming in very close contact, um, but it's it's to the side. And so that's where that concept of spiraling someone's structure comes in. And so getting someone by the shoulders, getting someone by the chin, or there's a couple um, uh, plays where it's back of the helmet or yeah front of the helmet or the or the, the horse's reins like reaching over the opposite side and, yeah. and make, making the horse i mean because if, if, the, if the horse is already doing something you can kind of encourage them and the rider to flip over that was, that was one yeah and, so um, but, but again you know if if you're not catching that stride right and your horse is already on its front legs where it's not generating power anymore and your opponent say does catch that right timing now that puts them at the advantage so it's you know again it's similar to fighting on foot where you maybe need to read that situation and if you screwed up where where you are in your horse's stride or that your opponent speeds up or, or changes their tempo in a way that you weren't anticipating you may have to change to a more defensive play so it's it's all happening in real time and, and you may not be able to play that offensive strike the way that that you would want it to um, to work out. So, well, and, and going back to something you already kind of mentioned that that now becomes more relevant in this moment. Again, if the moment of collision or the moment of two people are are trying to both at the same time arrive at that particular place in in a position in which they have the advantage. Now, just just like in a in a in a foot um, one on one situation. There's the the concept of sort of being relaxed and having the correct posture, and and, and the you know the the right sort of, I guess relaxation is the best way to put it. Is if you're if you're too tense, then you won't be able to feel what's happening and adjust to it because you have to untense and then change position and then retense for the actual response. That translates in, in riding into if you and your horse aren't communicating properly, mm -hmm. or if either one of you is tensing up, 
then there will be that delay between what you want to have happen and what actually happens. Which I mean, it seems to me that the the advantage of dressage is that the you know the competitive dressage ideal is it looks like there's a horse and rider and the rider is just sitting there doing nothing and the horse is doing everything automatically, right? Right. It, yeah, because sure. the, the cues the rider is giving are so small and subtle that if you don't know what you're looking at, you you can't see what what they're doing. Right. Um, yeah. For our, for our non equestrian or be, more beginner uh, types, those cues to the horses can be as subtle as a little squeeze of your calf. Um, you can do a little, you know, poke with the spur, but truly, a shift. It, it can just be yeah, just a weight shift into a seat bone. So if you push with one seat bone, you know, it it pushes them away from that pressure and you shift into the other. And so that's a hard thing to, to remember too, that if we're leaning into our opponent, we could be accidentally cueing that horse to move away from where we're trying to go. And again, it's similar to how do you shift your weight when you're fighting? You don't wanna, you don't wanna be leaning over and falling over. You want to be centered in, in your structure. And so or drop down or brace from the opposite direction. It's almost counterintuitive right. when it works. Right. Because you want to be you want to be driving more into that direction of your attack. And so it's very similar on horses. Um, I would actually argue that it it almost directly translates. Um, I was actually finding too that you know we we practice these turns. So a volta um, on the ground and how you set your feet the way that you pivot and you turn and you shift your weight on the ground is almost identical to the way that you would achieve a similar movement in the saddle. So to achieve a, a turn in the same sort of way or to volta into that sword hit or into that throw, we can basically do the same thing in the saddle and, and achieve that with the horse. And in that terms is- of, that, In terms of you, your, the, which foot is forward, which foot is back, dictates sort of what direction yeah. you're trying to turn the horse you know you're not you're not moving your feet quite so much apart because you are you know sitting in the saddle but that movement that's generated from the hips more or less so that movement from your hips which translates to your upper body and shoulders and it also shifts your weight a little bit and it shifts your legs so your legs are kind of stable rather than this this staggered position but it's it's this turn and you're affecting the same motion from that horse in that turn. And that was, that was mind blowing to me when I started thinking about it in those terms, when I started learning these, these turns and then trying to apply it to fighting on horseback. And then I thought, well, what if I do the same thing that I do when I'm fencing? And because my horses were trained in, in dressage and learned those kinds of cues, of course, it, it actually directly translated to that same thing. So what, and the and I mean the it's still a very learned thing and there and there's a lot of like human body mechanics that are slightly different because of what you have to achieve. But in terms of this is the principle, I'm trying to arrive at this result in this position. What do I have to do to make that happen? And the the parallels are the parallels are far greater than the specific differences in what the movements are. Absolutely. Um, and yeah. the thing also that I I want I want to mention, but then I'm going to ask you two about two specific things. The thing I want to mention, which you know, I'm sure you'll agree about. Um, that's very specific to medieval martial arts, martial arts in which you can perform while armored and riding a horse is in both of those cases, if your, if your torso is leaning in any one direction, you will be thoroughly punished for that. Yes, <laughs> for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. A horse that decides they don't want to do what you want to do and, um, excuse me one second. Sorry. No worries. Bye. Awesome weekend. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. See you later. Bye. Sorry, my fiance's leaving for his bachelor weekend with his buddy. Oh boy. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Well, um, good luck yeah, with that. So <laughs> four wheelers and uh, dunes. So hopefully they'll have fun. My, mine was all board games. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, her, her, she was talking to her friends and they're like, he's doing what? She's like, no, 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 this is good. This is good. He's not getting in trouble. He's just sitting in a cabin, drinking, smoking cigars and playing super duper space risk. It's perfectly, That's perfectly good. safe. Yeah, Very. I, I mean, four wheelers aren't exactly safe, but you know what? I, I love his buddies and uh, they're going to have fun. They're, they're good. They're, there's worse trouble to get into than that. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, um, sorry. So, uh, posture. Oh yeah. Posture. So if a horse decides that, you know, you're leaning one way and it's like, I don't want to do this. They go the other way. You're SOL. Yeah. You're going opposite directions. And, and back to that, I don't want to fall off an 18 head horse. Um, and then in martial arts, as we all know, if you, if you lean and you break your structure and your opponent is savvy and picks up on it, you're, you're going down, they're going to use your structure against you. So same exact thing. And now you add armor to that equation and you're top heavy. Um, and it makes either, uh, either situation horseback or on foot that much worse. Okay. The two things I want to ask you about that are relevant to, um, kind of doing what you're describing with the horse, sort of trying to get into the right angle and get in the right position to deliver that power better than your opponent. Two things I want to ask you about are um, the different gates the horses move at. Again, assuming the people watching this don't aren't super experts on horseback riding, there's, there's the different gates. And talk about bending the horse. Like, you know, the, the you kind of, even if your horse is going straight, you kind of have to decide which way they're, they're, they're bending, yes? Yes. Yeah. So um, that's a great question. So I guess we'll get into the bending first, just since that's the last uh, thing you said. So a horse um, is, of course, a, a quadruped. So they're on four legs, so front and back, and they have a pretty long thoracic and lumbar spine. Um, and they have curvature to it, um, and they can bend their body either way. And that actually significantly shifts where you are sitting in space. It may not necessarily affect their direction of travel as much, but it affects where you are supported by them and where your body sits. So that's really important. And am, I, am I right in saying also that, that having the horse bent a certain way is also a great way to keep all of their hooves on separate tracks so they don't kick themselves? Is that reasonable to say? Um, I think it's unlikely that they're going to be kicking themselves unless they're really overstepping um, okay. as much as where do you want their feet, depending on how you want to be working with them? Do you want them moving straight? And, and straight is relative because we usually, if we're, if we're kind of headed in a direction, we usually do achieve at least a small amount of curve. Um, if we're in an arena or on a rail, we, we curve them a little bit away from that rail or um, you know, potentially similarly on a jousting list. Um, so your body is therefore a little bit closer to the rail and their hooves are a little bit more off that track and the front end is, is just a, a hair in, but it's not much, it's subtle. Now, moving into other, other motions where we ask for a lot more curvature, either for a small turn or for something like a half pass, we are asking them to turn either into or away from their direction of travel. Um, and so it's a matter of, them moving with their body pulling in that direction or curved into that direction and the legs tra uh, trailing behind or vice versa where the body is trailing behind and the legs are moving the direction. And you can actually traverse in, in sort of a diagonal pattern without having to actually turn that horse. You can still be facing forward and you can achieve a more lateralized motion or uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's not quite a perfect strafe, but it's like the horse is, is facing a certain way and its body can be kind of moving laterally without changing that facing too much. Yes? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so if you start using that to your advantage, now you can actually move closer to your opponent without putting the horse's head in the way. Mm. Or you can push someone away by turning the horse, horse's haunches into them but you aren't necessarily moving farther away from them either. You can, you can kind of push them using your horse's body. And so you can create distance using the horse's bend. Well, talk a little more about that. You, again, the, the horse is a quadruped, so you, you, have to, you have to be able to control what direction, if any, their back end and front end and kind of their head and neck are moving or not moving, yes? Yes, yeah. So it's, uh, I guess How do you do that? <laughs> oh gosh, uh, that's, you know, it's funny in teaching people how to ride and teaching lessons, um, there are fundamental things that I think you forget when you do it for so long yeah. um, because you just do it, right? You don't think about how. Well, and, the wor and even worse than that, like if you're used to it and you're getting on a horse that's, that's had a lot of riders and is pretty decently trained, 
you just get on and you have a certain posture and they're like, okay. Like they just sort of assume the position. If they're, again, if they're like good and dirty, you know, sorry, if they're good and not dirty and like they, they know what, what's up and they know that they should do what you say and that's just going to make things better. Um, right. But yeah, you just like assume the position. They're like, oh, okay. Or you, you know, you know how to kind of unconsciously get them more on the bed or get them to sort of round up or relax a little bit. Like there's just things you do without even thinking about it um, when, you're, when you're more experienced. And also when the horse you're riding is more trained. Um, right. But, um, so I guess, I guess the long and the short of it is to control their head, you do have reins. So you do have that connection to their mouth. Um, and, it, you know, when you're just riding, you can have um, reins in either hand or you can have them gathered in a single hand. So for most mounted combat, we're gonna have it gathered in a single hand and you can either take that where you, you loop them up and over or I like to have a little bit more control just because, or for me it's more control, depends on, on how your horse is trained and, and how you're trained. I like to loop the reins where I've got, you know, the, the left side coming this way and the right side coming this way. So I also have a little bit of, of this instead of true neck reining just because yeah, I, I, I i like tying i like tying the knot again that assumes that the horse is is you know in control and isn't going to yank it forward um and so you know tying the knot means there's not quite as much control of lengthening the reins but there's no mm -hmm. chance of one really getting away from you either yeah, it's all trade-off i i tend not to tie a knot i just okay. i like to have one from one side one from the other and and hold them in this more of a, a horizontal position and for me it's just because i Again, I'm not as good at the neck reining. I prefer direct reining, yeah. which is that two, the two rein um, method. You have more um, control, for sure. Because of my background. To me, it makes me feel like I have more control or, or specific, and I can give more subtle cues. There's other people who are amazing at neck reining, and they use the right bridle and, um, and bit, and they can do it. I just well, And, and or the horse that they're using, like the horse knows like what the rein here versus the rein here means to them. You right. know, like whatever that, you know, and like. <laughs> um, so, you know, and, and we're really talking about subtle connection. We're not talking about yanking on their head. We're talking about very subtle cues and hopefully not having them pull on their face, you know, in, at, at that point. And so, sure. um, especially if we look at some of the bits, uh, some of the historical bits and the amount of pressure that those can generate because they have these really long lever arms on them, um, you have to be very subtle with your hands. Now, as far as controlling where the legs are versus where the body is, um, that really just does come down to the seat and pressure from your legs. And so it is about weight shifting. And I think it's until you're sitting in a saddle, it's a little hard to just describe what well, sure. you're face to face here. But let's say you want to bend a horse around your leg so you can if you try to bend their haunches around your leg, you would maybe slide your outside leg back just a hair, create a little bit of pressure there, and then create a wall more or less with your inside leg and you, you shift your seat. So if you shift your inside seat, they're going to move away from it, which means you can curve their body around your seat, but you're pushing them with that outside leg to, to hold them in place so that they don't truly move over away from your seat. Yeah, there's um, a, a crude way to describe it. It's like if, if the horse is like this, you're trying to turn them into like almost like a C, even though it's very, you know, yeah. crude to say, but like you want, you know, them to bend, you know, their, their front end and their back end kind of like this, and you have one leg here to kind of, to, to, you know, to make sure they're bending around it and not just going away from it. And then you yeah. have another leg that's sort of, a little bit back to, to get to get this part of it that stabilizes on the other side and so yeah. you're, you're curving them around your seat and you know you're not pushing too much with with your leg or, or pushing them over but you just want you do a little subtle shift and it asks them yeah. to bend yeah um, and, the, and the back leg and the reins tell them whether you want them to turn or just to bend yeah yeah exactly um you know, you would, you would hold them kind of stable and you can even create a little bit of, of a wall with that outside rein too. So you, you ask for a little bit of bend through the neck with the inside, but then you tell them, yeah, but we're not moving over. We're, we're actually staying right here. And so you give a little bit of cue from the front end and you give a little bit of, and you give cue from your body and your legs as well. So it's just basically having to coordinate those kinds of movements. Um, but again, it's, it's similar to, shifting your weight when you're even just standing in, in place. How do you shift? Do you want weight on your front leg or weight on your back leg? Do you want to take a step backwards or a step forwards? And how do you actually need to move your center of balance to achieve those things? And, um, and some of that does translate to the, the cues that you're giving in the saddle. 
or like, I mean, if you're, again, to bring it back to, you know, being on your feet as a martial artist, like is the weight in the balls of your feet or your heels or yeah. where between? Same question. Right. Yeah. Um, now talk about gates. This is we haven't talked about the different sure. gates that horses can can move in and and how that's relevant to mounted combat. Sure. Oh boy. So. Um, and also, how you know that? How you know which gates do different and that's, things? And that's where it's a really complicated question. Um, actually, I do discuss that a little bit in the article um, that was published now years ago, um, Greg Mealy put together a compilation of uh, presentations that were given at, at WMAW um, back in the day. Um, and so I, I wrote a little bit more in there about it. So a lot of that comes down to interpretation. You know, we're looking at still images. We don't know. Um, we can look at where those horses' feet are. Um, in a lot of the manuscripts, what we tend to see is horses sitting back on their haunches um, and rearing, up. they almost look like they're rearing up and they're on their hind legs with, with a little bit of variation here. Now it looks a little bit like, um, you know, a, like a horse rampant or something. Um, so there's some speculation that it's stylization, but there are also gates um, that we do see come out in these older breeds of horses like the Iberian horses where they have such a collected canter that what they're actually doing is it's, it's more of a two beat rocking type gate where they push with the back, land on the front, push with the back, land on the front. And it's a variation on the gate that's called canter. Um, so canter is kind of a, a middle faster gate. So we've got walk, which is a, a distinct four beat gate. We have so, they, they, so, so walk, they pick up one foot at a time, basically, or something one like that. One foot at a time, and they, they're slightly um, varied from each other. Um, trot is a two beat gate where they're moving diagonal pair legs together. Um, and then canter is uh, a three beat gate and you have different leads in the canter. Um, but then this, this more of a two beat canter, you sort of take away that lead, which can be advantageous as well if you're going to be quickly changing directions because you don't have to ask for a lead change. And when I say lead, it means which leg advances first and so they advance one and then follow to change leads they have to more or less kind of do a little skip to change which leg in, in the front and the back they're they're leading and placing with um and so, so and that, that's it like the, the the kind of again it's not an amazing analog but the analog to leads is like well imagine you were trying to you know gallop on two legs you would you would land one and then land the other one and they would be yeah. one forward one back and that determines in great part sort of where your power line is, where you're strong and where you're not so strong. So even though they yeah. have four legs, they still are, you know, lined up in a way that there's a stronger axis and a weaker axis. Right. Um, well, and um, and it's harder to turn when they're, you know, count on the opposite lead. Cantering. Yeah, on the opposite lead. So if they're turning in, in a direction and it's not that lead, we call it the counter canter versus you know, that, that canter uh, direction. Um, so there's a big difference there. So like your example of if, if we're galloping, you know, we were all kids at some point, we all did the little like, you know, skip, gather, skip, gather, you know, where, where we basically never advanced this, this leg in front of it. It's similar and you have to do this little hop change in the air to, to change which leg you're leading with. And so it's similar. So there, there is some theory. So getting back to the manuscripts and how we interpret it, there is some theory that the depictions that we're actually seeing in these manuscripts are showing this uh, this canter gate that is more of a, a two beat canter gate that is a very collected gate. And in practice, it actually makes sense. So a lot of our modern breeds of horses have a lot of difficulty achieving this, but now going back to these much older breeds and horses that are trained in a, a more Baroque style of dressage, um, they are able to do this and they can turn and they don't have to change leads. They can rise, so collect themselves on their, their back legs and push into the hit that you're um that you're trying to achieve you know on your opponent and so we that's kind of the theory working theory that that's probably the gate that is actually being depicted now i mean how how similar do you again this is principles not precise but how similar is that to like you know when you see a boxer and they're kind of going from foot to foot is it 
kind of like that where you because you're in a position that's sort of neutral you can spring out from that position yeah. to another yeah position. More, of a, more of a neutral position i would i would agree with that assessment so again this is this is speculation but it is something that works out in practice and actually looks very similar to these depictions in the manuscript so i think we're we're doing ourselves a disservice by looking at those images and saying that this is a stylization that these horses are actually cantering or galloping. I mean, some, so there are some theories, you know, for years that these horses must be just running past each other at a gallop so you can hit as hard as possible, but you're gonna miss the stride. Gallop is actually a very harsh gait to sit. Um, it's, it's hard to actually be connected to that horse. In fact, you tend to stand up in the stirrups a little bit to get up off their back in the gallop. Um, so to me, just from a biomechanical and structural standpoint and ease of movement, it, it makes a lot of sense that we're dealing with something um, that's probably a very slow collected canter. So that means that they, they're kind of, they're, they're doing that motion but they might not be reaching out as far as they could. They, they, might, they might almost be cantering in place if, if the horse is, is yep. athletic enough and the rider is, is, you know, has them in enough control. They could kind of be, again, sort of almost like doing this in place. What am I gonna do, what am I gonna do? Oh, he's, you know, he's turning, go, go that way, go this way, you know, strike out, go get him, that kind of thing. Absolutely, because you can then push them in that direction. You can, you can gather, 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 and you can build that power. Um, and then you, boom, you push him in that direction and go. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it would be a mistake to just stop your horse. And I've seen that before too, you know, in melees where you take, you know, you get like a, a jousting event together. You have people um, practicing melees with each other and you have horses that are trained in very different ways. Um, I've seen a kind of a bad habit arise where people will ride up to each other, stop, whack, 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 hit each other and, you know, then move on. Um, and you lose all of your power. You lose your maneuverability. Mm -hmm. You're basically a sitting duck in a way. So it, it comes down to who can whack with the sword or who can throw a punch um, better while you're literally sitting on your butt and unable to do anything versus if you can keep that horse moving and keep them collected, you can step in any direction at any time and you can actually generate a lot of power that appropriately drives a cut or a throw. Yeah, and it's more about not necessarily, you know, exhausting yourself, you know, with your exertions of the thing. It's more about, am I in the right position and am I aiming it correctly while this force does all of that work? Right. Yeah, for Jeez. sure. Um, I mean, have we, have we, we haven't really talked about, I mean, we talked like kind of around how dangerous working with horses and, and, and even worse, like doing things like this is. So mm -hmm. um, again, you've done a good amount of, of sort of con control as possible plays at this. I understand you were either doing this bareback or on English saddles. You didn't do anything resembling free play with those big medieval saddles, did you? No. Um. I have not personally. I don't have a ton of experience, honestly, in medieval saddles. Um, again, Arna and, and some of the other folks in Europe um, have done quite a bit of work where they're, they're having saddles built or they're building saddles that are much more historic. Um, they're jousting in these amazing historic saddles. And so they're definitely gonna be much more of, of your resources and, and experts in that area. To me, um, especially for starting off, I wanted, as easy of an out as possible um, so that we could get an understanding of how these plays work, but so that we weren't cranking on each other's spines or um, ending up in a situation where we are getting skewered uh, by a, a practice sword because we have so much power generated behind those swords versus you know, what we can do on foot. Um, so I did a lot of work bareback. I did a lot of work just in a dressage saddle. I do have um, a, a French Camargue saddle. Um, so What's that? It, it, I could go grab it. Um, but it's, it basically has a high pommel, a high cantle. Okay. Um, it looks a little bit like a, a medieval saddle, but it has a much more flat seat. So it's not like a real um, 
it's not like the saddles that we're really seeing in the manuscript so much, but it, it feels a little bit more akin and it was a modern saddle that we had access to. Fair enough. Um, right. So uh, I have done some work in that, but it's mostly been target practice and a little bit of very slow motion. Hey, let's do the setup for this thrower. Let's do the setup for this play and see how it feels in this saddle. Um, and that was a very interesting experience. Um, but as far as, you know, danger of doing this, oh my gosh. So, I mean, just riding, we were talking about some of our own spills and falls and things. And, you know, being a kid around horses, I sure got my fair share of falls and kicks and, and bites. I actually, um, I lost the very tip of, of, uh, this finger, <laughs> um, this finger when I was about 13 years old, uh, horse bit it off. Um, it grew back because I was 13 and, you know, you still regenerate body parts when you're that small. Uh, <laughs> um, it was just the, the very end of my finger. Um, I, I also broke same finger, um, spiral fracture when I was doing, uh, some in hand work with one of my horses, he spooked and pulled away from me and the rain just happened to wrap around the finger and um, pulled right out of my hand. Um, you know, so you have injuries like that, um, that just happen. Now you add weapons to the mix and you add another person to the mix and you add horses who are getting amped up because you have riders who are getting amped up and it's a whole nother level. Um, so, you know, a lot of my practice probably looks pretty boring. There's some videos out there from many years ago and, and a lot of the comments will, you know, you guys are moving slowly or this, you know, this is boring, you know, you got to really ramp it up. Um, but I've got to say, I don't really want to ramp it up when I, I need to get up and do it again the next day. And I need to be able to go to work the next day. Um, because it hurts when you take that many falls. It doesn't matter how good you are at falling. You eventually get bruised and, and it hurts. Um, there was a video and I think it's been, it actually was taken down. I think they felt a little bad that it was up there. I thought it was hilarious um, of me riding my friend's horse, Emerito, and she was riding up behind me. And there is a, a wrestling play um, where we talked about this, where you grab behind the chin and throw we were practicing grabbing the shoulder um, so that we're not cranking on each other's necks. But the play is to ride up behind your opponent and, and to pull them grab basically, off yeah. the side and spiral them off the horse. So we were doing it at the walk and I said, okay, let's speed this up a little bit. I want to actually feel what it's like to be thrown when you catch the timing correctly. And so she would canter and she kind of kept chickening out a little bit and she'd slow it down. And she finally, it was like, no, really throw me. I'm serious. Let's do it. And she did canter up behind me. Nice. What really was a slow collected canter. And my friend, she's, she's itty bitty. She's like this tiny little girl, uh, but oh my gosh, she's a, a beast on a horse. And she grabbed me and threw me and I did not have time to actually fall correctly. Um, you know, we talked about that moment when you're in the air and you're like, Hey, you need to tuck and roll. Yeah. That doesn't happen when you're actually being thrown when somebody catches the correct timing in their horse's stride you're on your horse and then you're on your ass in the dirt or your head yeah, that's, the, I would say that when, when my horse wiped out because of that mud that was this there was no gap like because I wasn't thrown up it was just the horse went like this you know the horse yeah. just did that um it's lost its balance yeah we could be that you know in a messed up way like being thrown is merciful because you have about I don't know not quite one second of oh I could maybe do something before whatever it happens happens yeah so you see so, so wait so so let's so, so I slow this down so so it's on what's who's who's on whose side so you were going along was she on your on your left side coming up behind you she was on my left side so and she was um, and she was reaching and trying to re reach around you and pull you to your right yes so it's no to the to the left so she came up on my left side so we're traveling parallel each other okay so I'm riding this way. I was going slow walk. She's okay. cantering up this way. Okay. She grabbed my right shoulder to spiral me down and off. Oh, okay, so, so she, so she was supposed to come around your kind of right side and grab your kind of chin and then pull you, but you're, yeah. you're, 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 you're then spinning and falling to your left. Yeah, if she would have okay. grabbed my chin, it would have been like yes. this. 
but instead she was grabbing this this shoulder from behind so spiraling me what in a, this and i'm direction. sure that again like again if you're really good at this maybe the best version of this is you grab you grab the person you hold on to them and yank them off the horse and then you're like dagger want to talk about this how about how about you pay me to you know let you go maybe you know that's like the maybe that's the the the, the least yucky version of the whole thing going right it's like you pull a person and now they're on now they're right here and it's like okay like say uncle please or or dagger right. and, and i right honestly <laughs> I, think, I think just coming off the horse is probably the lesser of you know all all evils above maybe um but i uh so in this it was captured on video she did it perfectly i mean executed the throw absolutely perfectly cantering up behind me she caught the stride correctly spiraled me out i was just walking because i was like well let's let's take this in step you know let's let's ramp this up slowly here and um i'm pretty sure i cracked my tailbone um it oh ooh. um so i hit the ground really hard right on my tailbone even though i was you know my back was pretty rounded but just hit it in the right way and so I was writhing on the ground saying, that was awesome. Oh, God, it hurts. That was really awesome. <laughs> Perfect bro. And she felt horrible, but um, oh it was great. I, but I couldn't ride for at least a few days, and, and getting back in the saddle hurt. Um, so definitely put a little damper on the practice. So to me, that's just a really good example of why, you know, especially when we're specifically working on throws and falls, it's it pays to just take it slowly and know it may not be the most exciting thing in the world, but when you're the one being thrown off of your horse, it's pretty damn exciting in that moment. Mm -hmm. So. <laughs> well, then the, I mean, again, there's, there's so much we don't know, or there's so much that we have to either extrapolate or imagine, but it, it understanding sort of how dangerous it is to get caught in transition by someone who knows what they're doing it would make sense if, you know, the, the folks who are practicing this, again, like night versus night kind of thing, it would make sense for them to conduct themselves in a sort of, let's lure them into a good position as, as opposed to just, you know, diving at them with the horses running. It would make sense sure. to, I mean, if, or if that was placed in a sort of theatrical sort of context, it would, it would make sense. It's like, oh, like this person might just be charging in there. Well, it, they can't really, maneuver if they do that so okay let's get over here and we'll we'll take them at a better at a better angle there's a way to again my, my point of departure for all of this is um sort of trying to turn as much of the historical aesthetic into like an interesting theatrical staged fight mm -hmm. um because it there are so few, i mean there's almost zero historical medieval sort of staged um fights that i think are any good very few um more now than i think to then 10, 10 years ago but still not very many um For sure. because again there's this anachronistic sort of set of limitations on oh this is what happened we've decided this is how it went it's like based on what like based on a bunch of insanely heavy armor that you found from henry the eighth's time like what what's your justification for this you know like the the fiction and, and operas from the 19th century that has made up sort of backwards what this is to them like it's a little tricky to you know like I, I think that having more aesthetic choices if nothing else is is useful and that's why I'm, I'm so interested in, in you know having the aesthetic choices that are supported by the you know the as much realism as we can muster right um horses are rough though <laughs> doing right. it safely at least yeah, it's it's hard doing it safely, especially when you're doing it right. I think you know you can you can wail on each other all day when you're not doing it right, um, because you don't have the kind of power and leverage um, when you're just kind of running at each other, running up and stopping, and then running away. Um, and and jousting, um, you know, if you're doing that right too, you actually I think have an advantage if you slow down a little bit and try to collect your horse because again, as you say that that uppercut, if you can hit your stride correctly and you can hit with that lance when that horse is moving up in its forward stride, you have that advantage on your opponent. You're going to have a much more solid hit, um, and you're not going to be the one who's driven down into your you know into your seat or something. Well, that, um, again, I, there's people who are a lot more acquainted with, with jousting than, than I have been. But my experience was that there's so many variables 
because if you're moving that quickly, there's a very small window in which you can both be, or one of you can be aiming correctly. It's a lot of just luck. It's like roll the dice, you know, put, put your, you know, control everything you can control, which is your body position. Do your best to get the horse on the rail and in the position that's the strongest you can. Um, some, I mean, some really serious folks can sort of have their horse um, strafe off the rail slightly. So they're, they're kind of deliberately aiming a little deep and then they have their horse move a little bit. So they're moving away from being a target and they're already set up. I mean, there's stuff you can do, but there's just a lot of dice rolling. It's right. like, I don't well, know if we'll hit each other today. Let's see if what happens. And if you're, and if you're running, then the chances of making an adjustment at the last instant are very small, you know, which right. again, makes it, it makes a lot of sense to, to be moving. Like if, if you're going at someone who is going at you to slow it down, to have a little more control over how that moment means. So I'm, I'm just, now I'm right. trying to think about what that would actually look like if you tried to do it theatrically in a way that was, you know, as much in control as possible. Honestly, the thing that I've been thinking for a long time that I've been totally unwilling to sort of try to get the, the architecture together for, it's probably doable now, um, just a matter of tricking someone to pay for it, would be probably the best way to illustrate a lot of this stuff would be with motion capture and with video game design. Mm -hmm. Because there's no human that gets hurt. It's, you know, you take this, you take this stuff, you know, to extrapolate what the, you know, what the body mechanics of the animals and the people are, but then you can use your, you know, your, your game engine to, to determine what actually happens if, if, you know, when they collide, depending on who's where. Yeah. That'd be the safe way think, to do it. I think it'd be so cool to like, to actually work off of real time kinematics and, you know, use reflective markers on, on a horse and rider who can maybe go through some of the motions so that you can get those, um, equations into the computer so it actually starts to learn that that motion and the horse rider connection so you get someone who is a really accomplished jouster accomplished even just dressage rider and and put that into the the computer and see what you can generate i mean that would be absolutely amazing yeah well, i mean again you would you would need to i mean you basically have to like mobilize the architecture mm -hmm. and bring it to an arena so that you could, you know, position the, you know, the cameras and whatever, you know, whatever configuration you would need for them to catch every angle. And then you'd need to have whoever it is do everything at every gate right. and then plug it in. And I'm sure they've done things like this with just horses running because you've seen, you know, very faithful reproductions of horses running, you know, I mean, it, if, if nothing else, when they have a horse wipe out or get, you know, horribly, you know, murdered on, you know, in a, in a big movie, well, that's, that's a CG mock-up and good thing, you know, lucky for that. Um, right. So like there's aspects of it they've already done, obviously, but the, but that the subtlety of like, oh, you know, you're not just turning left, like you could, you could straight, you know, you could, you could half pass left or you could be, you know, slowing down to almost a canter in place. So such things, I mean, I think even even the interface with uh, if you were playing a game like that, the interface for what you could tell the horse to do when would be rough because again, when you're really doing it, you have not just two hands, you have two hands and two legs and every you know, can, you know all the different things on your on your both limbs, and you have your posture. You have all these ways to communicate. Um, mm -hmm. It'd be tricky to to manage that if if it was a again if it was a game you were trying to play, unless it was in VR and you actually had like a VR saddle rig thing set up i mean this might have happened who, who knows if you know and, be amazing <laughs> like you know like some kind of robotic thing i don't know but i mean but it, unfortunately testing it out with real people is just super dangerous as you said right, right. um but it's but I, um i'm glad you talked about um the sort of conflict amongst even very careful practitioners over what the illustrations in the manuals mean. Um, I, I, I think that's, um, again, we're gonna, you know, after we finish this, we're going to, we both are connected with Brian Stokes, who is connected with the, the Getty Museum. And we're gonna be able to talk to, you know, we're gonna be hearing from the curator and I don't know exactly, exactly what about their different documents, but they have that Fiori um, manual, the actual manual that we studied, the, or so the, the, the highest quality perhaps 
copy that we know about in the world happens to be here in Los Angeles at the Getty Museum. And Brian Stokes has been looking just super closely at this manual because, because of his connections, he's able to really look at it in real life and natural lighting. You know, of course, the, the person at the museum has to like turn the pages with gloves very carefully and everything. It's very, you know, delicate. Um, but he's looking at, when he's looking at the, the manual in natural lighting, and you can almost see this in the really good scans, but in natural lighting, you can really see it like that there's been multiple corrections where the, the vellum, you know, the parchment has been scraped away and they've changed just like whether someone's, someone's foot position or someone's fingers, the way they're drawn, the way they're positioned. Mm -hmm. It's what, you know, if you can actually see this thing, it's obvious that all of the words and all of the illustrations in the manual are precisely what the master wanted to be there. And they all mean something. And, yeah. um, and the closer, and he's been just like staring at these high, high resolution scans for years at this point. And his changes in interpretation have already been very useful for our practice. You know, just even just, here's what, here's one example. And again, I don't know if this is right, but it's working very well for us is just f the full iron gate position. Just the, 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 the foundational guard, you know, low guard. Um, mm -hmm. What the, the main thing that we've changed is um, instead of having our lead leg pointed at our imaginary opponent or at our opponent, we're actually turning our lead leg so our power line is actually off track with that mm -hmm. guard. And the, what the result of that is, is if you're in this low kind of provocative guard, you're already set up to step offline mm -hmm. with whatever comes your way or, or to, you know, to step offline and, and change positions. Um, so that's been, and the, the thing that's been hardest for me over the past 10 years, but I think I've been focusing on really the past four years has been trying to make offline um, movement and pivoting more intuitive and more my natural response. Cause it's so easy again with, with the, you know, the culture of sports fencing and also with modern, modern athletic shoes, which athletic shoes are good for this, not so good for this. Right. To be able to step and keep moving around the opponent and using that circular arena as well. Um, and um, the way I think about a lot of the stable guard positions has changed because I think to myself, oh, like when I'm not in distance, it's actually not that important to be, to, to have my power line directly on my opponent. It's important to be positioned so I can get out of there and get in a better position. Um, and I'm not saying that it works all the time, but it's been really useful for me getting my mind right for the way I step when I'm, when I'm free playing. And that's just, again, like he, that's him staring at this, the way the guard is illustrated. And he's like, wait, this person's not looking there. They're looking here. If that's true, then that means they're, and he does that for even like the way someone's holding the sword. He's like, oh, like when you cut, it's actually you, the, the hand position. He's convinced the hand position is actually a little more like Japanese swordsmanship, where instead of when you cut having your knuckles lined up, it's actually more like this, which mm -hmm. is weird. But if you actually snap into it, the power generation is pretty solid, like that kind of whip crapping motion of doing that. Um, but anyway, uh, uh, I would recommend um, reaching out to, to Brian and, and talking to him. He'll, he'll I mean, and there's, there's also weird stuff that, again, is impossible to illustrate by a video, but like, you know, during the dagger stuff, it's like, if you're holding the dagger, it's like, are you, is your thumb like this, or is it like this, or is it on top of the thing? And mm -hmm. it's not like any of those one positions are correct or incorrect. They work the best if you and your opponent are in a certain position and, they, and they're weaker in another one. So like the architecture, even of like where your thumb goes, can make can be the difference between you do the thing correctly or they reverse it on you. And that's all in the illustrations. So the notion that these are just stylized or they're just sort of, you know, oh, it's 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 non, it's like pre-perspective art and like don't worry too much about it. It's like, no, no, no. <laughs> this is all very expensive. <laughs> <laughs> it has to it has to mean what it's what it's what it shows. It's just not obvious to our modern eyes what it what it what it's saying to us. Right, because it is a slightly altered perspective, but it is very precise in a lot of ways. 
Um, it's interesting that you mentioned the foot position though, because Fiore, um, those horses have been a little bit more of a conundrum for me um, and mm. some of my colleagues in interpreting those because there are some of the plays where we see that collected position that I was describing. But depending on the manuscript that you're looking at, which, you know, which Fiore rendering, um, you actually will see different foot positions of those horses that almost looks more like a tolt that we would see in like one of the Icelandic horses. Um, so it's actually a four beat gait, but it's uh, a much faster paced four beat gait. It's, um, or like a flying walk. It's a little bit odd. I, I'm, I'm actually honestly not that familiar with that particular gait pattern because it's not a breed or, or a discipline that I've ever worked in. Um, but if you look at their foot positions, it just doesn't quite fit with some of the other work that we've been, we've been doing or with some of the other manuscripts. So I would love to see um, what some others think on that or if anyone's put any more recent work into it um, because they, they do appear a little bit different than some of the horses in the other manuscripts. Well, and again, going back to, to my aesthetic sort of point of view, well, that's what that says to me in a way is what, like, I mean, going back to the very, very beginning, different sorts of horses are good at different sorts of things. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it could simply, it could, one part of it could be, well, we're just showing different kinds of horses that we might expect to encounter in the, you know, period in which, the, you know, it, it's been drawn. And maybe this particular horse over here is better at this particular thing over here. I don't know, but that's interesting. And that, and like, if if there was a again a, a very sort of um, high resolution medieval sort of melee tournament set, you know, scripted um, television show or movie in which there were you know sports fans arguing about oh no this is the horse you want your guy to be on not that one over there like this horse is better oh no it's not i'll i'll punch you in the face you you know i'm right you're wrong you know this fight it's like well who knows you know oh but this horse lost this 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 guy and this horse lost last time to this guy you know it's like or it could get this guy from this region on this horse all this stuff it's all these variables that we can pretend like we know what they mean right Um, here's, a that I, here's a question that here's a question that here's a question that I, that I've been asking every time as much as I can. Um, what do you um, what is the what do you believe is the HEMA community's greatest weakness or greatest I weaknesses? I don't know if it is fair for me to answer right now, having been out of it for a couple years. Um, and I've been a little disconnected, even when I was still actively practicing, I have not been part of the tournament community. I've mm. not been going to a lot of events. So I was, I was fairly insular in working with the Rocky Mountain Sword Play Guild um, in Colorado, um, just because of my own personal commitments. So where I used to be very involved, I could certainly comment on that. I, I can't comment so much on, on more recent times. Um, throughout you know, my many years of practice, I do think that one of the greatest weaknesses that I did encounter was the dissonance between um, tournament fighters and the groups that designated more as WMA. So there was definitely, you know, HEMA versus WMA, Western martial arts versus historically European martial arts with HEMA having more of a bent towards the, um, the tournament style of fencing. But, you know, there are certainly groups in both sides that had leanings in one direction or another. And so there was this mentality, I think, from more of the uh, trying to pursue a, a more purist uh, historical approach versus a tournament approach where people said, well, you know, they're, they're doing this for sport. It's different. You're getting, you know, these tournament style weapons and you're getting these rap shots and, and different hits and, and uh, we call them TDIs, two dead idiots, uh, where you're hitting each other within seconds of each other. Um, They've gotten a lot better about that. I, I was pretty cynical yeah. about that for a while, but, um, I, and I kind of stepped away for a minute for personal reasons um, as well. But um, to the, the past, it's funny, you, you were kind of away the past two years. I kind of came back the past two years and had a great time. I had to get my mind right as well. Like I, I, uh, two SoCal sword fights ago, my objective was, okay, footwork, have fun. And it went great. 
Um, and I kind of had the same mentality this year. And it was funny, like this year, SoCal Sword Fight was like right before the lockdown. It was like a week or two before the lockdown. So it was like the last event a lot of folks got to be at. Um, but um, what was I going to say? I, 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 I feel as though the, the fencing in tournaments has gotten a lot cleaner, like in terms of you, when you see it, if it's, if it's clear, usually the judges agree with what you just saw. And if it's not clear, usually the judges are all, usually the judges all say something different. And then like, it's like, okay, no points because we don't know what just happened. Right. Um, no, I, I've definitely seen improvement there in, in yeah. what I have been following. And I guess, so my comment is actually more though on the disconnect between the two factions. And so, sure. you know, that's, that tends to be the comment from the historical people and the comments from the, the tournament fighters is, well, if you never actually put this into practice, if you don't actually experience this at real speed with adrenaline and real time, you know, are you truly learning your art? And so I think that that sort of infighting or, or that separation that happened was very detrimental. And I think that that's also improved that there's been a lot more um, crossover and a lot more connection of people from both sides as well. And, and that's where I say, it's probably unfair for me to comment given my, you know, my position in the community right now. Sure. But to me, that was, that was probably one of the biggest shames that I ran into is, is just such separation of, of communities. Well, yeah, and I, I agree with you. I don't, I don't think you're wrong at all in your assessment, and that, that really hasn't changed. If anything, it might have gotten worse in the past two years. I mean, worse is subjective, but it's, I think, because you're dealing with groups of people, tribalism is almost inevitable, and, and when there's people who are trying to learn or teach something, orthodoxies are inevitable. And I think that the people who I get along with much better have a sense of humor about that stuff. Um, if, if you're a little too um, nestled in, in either corner, I think you're in danger. Because, it, and, and what I, I, the, the two corners that I put it in is it's, there's the, and I would even say the, the you know, purist slash sort of academic scholars are in one corner. And I'm not saying they're the same people, but like the, the mentality of, we're trying to figure out the, you know, the real way to do this and and we're trying to deduce it this certain way and then there's you know the more pure tourney fighters who they're just they're, they're, they could maybe even have backwards engineered how they're supposed to fight from fighting in tournaments it's a perfectly reasonable way to, to win tournaments is like what works in tournaments that works I'll do that next year oh it worked I'll keep you know there's a perfectly reasonable way to win tournaments um, but uh, but in, in but if if they're isolated, then everyone loses because, um, and I, I talked to Brittany Reeves about this last time. Um, mm -hmm. You know, with, with without the tourney fighters, the academics can't test anything that they're coming up with, and without the academics, the tourney fighters should just invent lightsaber fighting and have that be the thing they do. Because like, why would you? Why do you care about historical stuff? You could just make up pretend weapons and have tournaments with those. Like, right. there's no point. If you, if you don't care about the history, what's to stop you from completely inventing your own, you know, pretend art that isn't, a, you know, martial art? So right. I think everyone, there needs to be enough of a Venn diagram intersection for the thing to be anything like what we say it is. Absolutely. I'm 100%. What do you think is, is, is a great strength of, of uh, HEMA? I think a great strength of HEMA is how we have people who have come together from so many backgrounds and bring mm. experience from other martial arts, other professions, um, other disciplines. And because it is a newer martial art, in a way, we've been accepting of those ideas in the interpretations and rebuilding of the art and so i think that's a huge strength i'm gonna go ahead and like ruin everything right now by saying <laughs> historical european martial arts greatest strength is cultural appropriation <laughs> yeah <laughs> in the broadest you know most sort of you know like assimilate but you know by the borg sense it's like does that work use it does that work use it yeah, no, you're absolutely right because I, you know, I have so many friends and colleagues that 
have again backwards engineered from their their previous experiences um you know my old teacher greg mealy uh he has a strong background in aikido and um he actually had a background with the sca and so he basically in the beginning was taking what do i know about moving the human body what do i know about biomechanics how do you throw someone how do you move someone through space how do you move your body through space from his past experiences and applied it but then also through many years of, of interpreting those manuscripts now how do you change that how do you manipulate that and so i mean so many of the people who are really strong figures in this community who have really built it from the ground up do have backgrounds in other Asian martial arts or boxing or wrestling, um, um, people with military or police background and, and the martial arts with that. And how do you take what you know from the practice of those martial arts and apply it to this? Because we, we really don't have a living tradition that we're building from. Yeah, we have, to, we have to steal from other martial arts that have a track record for being pressure tested successfully in real circumstances. Yeah. But I mean, realistically, if you look at a lot of martial arts out there, I mean, as soon as something becomes competitive, it changes a little bit because you, you're trying to win the game rather than necessarily being purist. And again, the tournament versus, you know, purist academic approach. But um, really, when you look at a good martial arts system, there are only so many ways to move and to move the body and to move a weapon through space. Um, the configuration of that weapon does help to dictate some of that to a certain degree. So looking at a single edge blade versus a double edge blade or, you know, different types of daggers. But, but really at the end of the day, there's only so many ways that you can use a weapon and that you can use your body to inflict damage or movement on another body. And so you're trying to slash, stab, bludgeon, or throw. <laughs> there you go. Or Simple. strangle, you know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, here's a, I'm, again, even though you're sort of disconnected, I am curious. Um, and again, I, I don't know how qualified you feel like speaking to this, but if someone was brand new to, to equestrian arts and or to, to martial arts, where would you recommend they begin? And I know that's a, 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 almost like an impossible question to ask, but, you know, let's say someone, you know, if they're, let's just say they're not in a major city, but that they're, you know, a reasonable drive from a major city, and, you know, and maybe they have one person they could train with for martial arts, um, but what, but, but no teacher that they are connected to personally. How would you, how would you start if you had someone new asked you, like, what should I do? I, this is where I live and this is where I'm at. You know, how do I start learning this stuff? Yeah, I think finding out a person's end goals that they even know um, mm. it's important because of how, you know, how do they want to go down that path? So are they more interested in tournaments? Are they more interested in a more academic approach? Um, what if they don't know? But yeah, and if they don't know, I mean, I, I'm an academician. I, I've got a lot of degrees and, and you know, <laughs> just finishing, uh, you know, after a doctorate, four more years of postdoctoral training. So I'm probably a little biased. Um, so I would probably point them towards some of the schools that really are taking a very critical look at the manuscripts and that offer intro type classes to get your, to essentially get your feet under you, to learn the basics. I, I think there's a lot to be said for throwing someone right into the mix, but at the same time, the way I learned and the way that I see students really grow and blossom tends to be when you, you start them with, how do you place your feet? How do you center your structure? How do you move your body? Now, what are these basic concepts of triangle spirals and waves? And how do you move another person's body? How do you move a weapon through space? How do you hold your weapon? Go through drills, go through very structured drills of how do you move? How do you control this weapon? How do you control your body? Um, and then you can build on that foundation. 
And, and so there are some wonderful programs. Um, again, you know, my experience is, is primarily the Chicago Sword Play Guild and the Rocky Mountain Sword Play Guild. And I think that they both have phenomenal programs because they do just that. They build from the ground up and then they have different levels of classes and they have different levels of instructors. And, you know, it's, I've never been a huge proponent of ranks, but it's a way for people to set benchmarks for themselves. And so having some kind of a testing system to give people a benchmark and a, and a goal to reach for um, that allows them to then further advance in the art and to, to learn new, um, new weapons even. But I think, you know, picking your weapon, um, incorporating wrestling, um, I think that's a thing that gets missed by a lot of schools because people get so hung up on the sword. But I've, I've learned the most about biomechanics and moving my body through learning wrestling um, and then applying it to the weapon arts. So finding a school that actually does have a little bit of that, that more broad range that teaches you how to use your body. That's, that'd be my recommendation from somebody who is just starting if they don't know what they wanna do, learn how to move your body, how to wrestle, how to hold a sword, how to hold a dagger, how to move through these plays that are depicted in the manuscript. Now, how do you apply that to sparring? Um, and have- But also add how to, how to fall down without getting hurt. Yeah, that is so important. Um, and actually that was something that I, maybe before we, we get off the call, it was a super fun thing, but that was actually a big part of my training was actually learning how to appropriately fall off a of horseback. And you probably have quite a bit of experience on that too. Um, <laughs> yeah. but that's, that's huge. So rolling and falling, because if you can't fall, you're going to get hurt at some point when you are actually sparring and, and adrenaline is, is ramping up. Well, and the, and it, it's, I mean, I, I don't necessarily believe that you need to be a young athletic person to learn how to fight with swords yeah. or to ride horses. But, but the danger with the horseback riding journey is if you don't learn how to fall the least bad possible when you're younger and you fall when you're older, you could die. Yeah. <laughs> I you mean, know, you could it's... die anyway, but I mean, you want to give yourself a chance because I, and I'm, and I'm confident that a lot of people who die because their horse throws them are people who took horseback lessons for a long time, but never learned how to fall as safe as possible. And then they got thrown when they were older and it's like yeah. game over. I, there will always be freak accidents and you can't discount that because some of the most, you know, there are some incredibly accomplished riders out there who have met very tragic ends or injuries. Um, but yeah, I, I tend to agree that, you know, if you never learn how to fall, you're putting yourself at much greater risk. And so learning how to bounce when you're younger is probably helpful because, you know, now in my mid thirties, I definitely don't bounce the same way I do, but I feel much better about it now, you know, having, learn how to appropriately fall than I ever would have if I hadn't. Um, side tangent, funny experience for me. So I do martial arts. I fall. I have no problem with that. I've, I've trained myself how to fall off of horses. Um, skiing. I now live in Colorado. I grew up in the flat Midwest. I've never really skied before. And I'm like, hey, this is super fun. I'm athletic. I should have no problem. I am terrified on that slope because I just... I, for whatever reason, I'm so afraid of that fall because it's a completely different kind of a situation. And I just never learned how to do that when I was small or young and extra flexible and, um, and had the wherewithal. So it's just been kind of funny because I'm like the world's most cautious skier because I just never, I never learned that, um, that context. Yeah. And like sometimes the skis pop out when you fall and sometimes they don't. So right. <laughs> roll the dice. Right. Right. Um, yeah. But no, and for, for, for horseback riding, again, if someone was new, and this is something that's also very specific, because I uh, the question that I'd ask you is, if someone's new and they're not rich, if they like basically broke and they want to learn how to do this, how could they do that? Oh, that's a really good question. Because um, that's I mean, the, like a big rough spot is like horse, I mean, Nema can be expensive, sure, but it's getting cheaper because there's so many ways to buy reasonably priced weapons and protective gear now, which is a great benefit to the tournament thing. Like that's, if there's, if there's one like unmitigated good to the tournament thing, it's, oh, you can get lots of weapons and protective gear a lot more cheaply now and more easily than ever before. That's good. Right. But there's no getting around how expensive horse care and, and the equipment to ride and, to, and, and, you know, and interact with horses is. Yeah, I, I mean, 
I, I got one of my horses for a dollar. It was kind of an adoption scenario and I cannot begin to tell you how much that horse has cost me throughout his life. Um, no, you, getting him is not the problem. It's keeping them alive. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> keeping them alive and healthy and boarded and fed. Um, but just as a rider to learn, um, at least to start. Again, I'm biased. I do think that dressage training is an amazing place to start because it really does teach you the fundamentals on the ground. It teaches you physicality, how to use your body, how to use very subtle cues with that horse. And it translates to every other discipline. Um, even it's if like ballet for horses. dance. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it, or ballet for horses. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, in terms of like, you know, if, if you learn ballet as a dancer, it, it's only helpful in other styles yes. of dancing. Yes, for sure. So I, I think that for me, that would be a great foundation. But how would you get into that? That's a great question. So, um, you know, just learning how to be around horses is really important because if you're not confident with horses on the ground, you probably shouldn't be getting on their back either. Um, and so just, there are sometimes volunteer situations where people will let you come and learn how to help feed and groom and tack up a horse, pay your dues, and somebody will probably let you start to take lessons and ride. Um, so that, if you're talking about, you know, I have no money, but I really want to learn about horses and at least get my feet wet until I'm in a better situation where I can actually pay for horses, um, help someone because there's a lot of people who, who have horses and just don't have the time um, that they would like to have um, for those horses. And so being able to help them from a time perspective and a labor perspective, I think that there are avenues to, to actually get lessons. And yeah, advice. especially if they're, if they're older or they're getting older and they're not as athletic as they used to be, or they have an injury recently, but they still need their horses to get exercise. That seems to be a, 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 like a gap you could, you could exploit as well. And it seems like, again, there's, it seems there's, there's fewer and fewer very obvious skills in nowadays by which there's an apprentice sort of structure to learning it. And it seems like learning how to ride horses is something yeah. that still fits into that. It's like, yo, like, I'll, I'll work for you for free if you give me lessons in exchange. And that seems yeah. to go fine for a lot of people. It's, again, assuming everyone's playing straight and no one's being dirty about it. In the horse industry, there is the concept of a working student, and that, that is still a very alive tradition. Um, the hard part about being a working student is oftentimes those positions come with an expectation of a certain level of riding already, because part okay. of the work that you're doing is providing educated exercise for those mm. horses in exchange for lessons to further improve your art. So I, I think to come into a really good working student relationship, you already have to have a strong foundation. I'm, I'm talking really like hobby farm kind of like, I just want to learn how to sit on a horse and be around a horse because that, you know, that's the very basic place to start and then save your money to try to get a few really good lessons. Um, some of the best lessons I've ever had, even as an experienced rider are actually on a lunge line where you can focus on one thing at a time. You can focus on your balance in your body and the person on the ground has a lot more control over that horse. Yeah, explain um, that to people who don't know what that means. So lunge, yeah. what, what, what is being on a lunge line? So it's where you have a person on the ground, so a trainer on the ground, and the horse is connected to a line, usually through the bridle or a specific um, harness. Uh, so it's it's a rope. It, it, the lunge line is a rope, yeah? Yeah, it's a rope. Um, or, or like a, a nylon or a cotton line. Um, sure. And especially if the horse is wearing a bridle or these specialized uh, um, harnesses, essentially, you actually, the person on the ground has pretty good communication with the horse and they, they hold a long whip. They're not whipping the horse. The whip is a, something to make noise and to get a visual attention for that horse and to help move them along and, and yeah. keep them in different put pressure on them from behind so that there's sort of like a pressure behind and then kind of the outward pressure of them being on the, the line going around in a circle so the horse sort of has a almost like a track you know to be on so, so you have some yeah. you know some tension with them yeah right and so what they're you're doing from the ground then is that 
the person in the middle is essentially having the horse go around them in a circle. And then you can, so you can do that just by yourself, you know, by yourself to work a horse, to exercise a horse. That is actually one of the ways that I start, um, you know, my, my current horse, I got him having only ever been ridden on a racetrack. And so we had to put a lot of work and time um, into him to teach him how to be an acceptable riding horse. Um, oh, that's funny. <laughs> it's like, yo, when I get on you, you can just stand there too. That's fine right. as well. <laughs> right. So we did a lot of work on the lunge line and we did a lot of in hand work, meaning much closer where you can even have a double reins and, and work with them from the ground. But, but so the lunge line can be a tool for, for exercise and training, but it can also be a, a tool when you have a rider on the horse because it allows them to maybe not have to think about their hands. They can be doing other things. They can work on, on balance. They can, um, you know, do different things, you know, you, you like touch your shoulders, you touch your head, you, you do different things with your hands, um, or you can place them like you'd be holding reins, but you get to focus on your seat, you get to focus on your core, you even don't necessarily have to steer that horse because it's on that circle. And so you can work on things like balance. And it is such an important part of, of the foundation of riding that it's something that I think even experienced riders should keep going back to. But I think that working with a good trainer and starting there is also a really great way to, to get comfortable on a horse and learn how to move with a horse. Well, yeah, and the thing that again, um, you know, when they, when they had us uh, start our training at medieval times, because when I, when I went to medieval times, I wasn't a, I wasn't a rider. I'd taken lessons one summer and hated every second of it. I was a very timid kid. I wasn't really a dominant person. And, it's yeah. not like it was the very best situation. I don't think the trainers were super amazing, um, mm -hmm. you know. But it's, especially if you're if you're not a very dominant person or you don't know how to ask and like really stand by your ask, horses can just sort of take you for a ride. And like even if they're not being dangerous, they're just I don't feel like doing what you say. You can't do anything about it. You're not going to kick me. I'm just going to do this over here. Right. Um, but but w when they the, when when they trained us in medieval times again, it was the you know the trainer was on the ground with the line and the you know the long whip and the trainee was on the horse on the lunge line. And it was, and essentially they were, they would start out by just doing transitions up and down between gates, often up to and including canter when we're very, very new. And the trouble, the, the, again, like the great, but also terrible thing about being on that, on that lunge line and doing gate transitions is, well, how do you ask the horse to change gate? How much help do you need from the person on the ground? And when they change gates, you might fall off. <laughs> Because the rhythm between those different gates is different. And so the, the, you know, learning to ask for those gate changes and maintain one's balance um, without being able to use your hands to balance is a big, a big challenge. Um, so, yeah, even if you're experienced, like having that, just, just focus on balancing on the horse, asking for transitions, and, and keeping your posture consistent and relaxed as possible between transitions. It's very valuable. Yeah, well, and, and I think a, a crutch that a lot of brand new riders fall back on is they'll, as you say, balance with their hands. So they balance on the reins, or they, they put their hands down. But if they're, you're balancing on your reins, it means you're pulling on your poor horse's face and, and their mouth and that's not fair to the horse and that's a terrible habit to get into because your reins should really be a subtle cue to your horse and so um, that lunge line lesson where you don't get to use your hands really does teach you to center yourself and to balance without that crutch and when you do then pick up the reins it makes you a much more effective rider. Yeah, so because that because then you're you know even if even if you're messing with your balance as long as you're kind of keeping your reins at that sort of you know firm but reasonable contact point you know it's almost like everything's sort of independent it's like independent suspension all of your limbs are on independent suspension in a way right um, you know it's reins are kind of a funny thing to a concept to get because in a way your arms are connected to your core and so as you move they should move with you but at the same time they need to be disconnected enough that you can give an independent cue you know even if something crazy is happening back here you you have that independent cue so you're not yanking on the horse's mouth if you know something throws you off balance you can you can disconnect that you can give that release to to your horse if you need yeah a, a great danger with the you know if people are using their horse's reins as a crutch for balance the great danger is then that the horse basically gets desensitized to that because well they're, they, they, they know they're not actually supposed to stop because they're also getting pushed from behind during that moment so then when, when someone else who's more trained is maybe riding them, 
the horse is not necessarily as sensitive to the pressure on their mouth because they've been desensitized by someone using their mouth to balance. And that's not good because it's like, okay, now we have to like reprogram both of us right now, which is, you know, right. not much fun. Horses right. are like, what do you, you know, it's like, you can't just tell them what you want, like with words, like, and even if you did, I don't know how much they'd appreciate it. It's like, no, 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 this is it. This, this means this. Yes. And they're like, eh, this means this. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's better. Okay. Now we're, you know, and how, how long that transition is also is trouble. It's like how, you know, who is this person on me? What are they saying? Oh, okay. That makes sense. Or like, who's this person on me? I'm going to mess with them. <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> um. Uh, oh, you know, here's a here's a here's a a, uh, a question that I ask, which is an impossible question. Um, do you have a favorite weapon? Um, yeah, I'm pretty partial to the longsword. I do, I do have a favorite weapon. That's a very definite one. Um, again, you know, the weapon I started with, and I've tried spear, I've tried poleaxe, um, I have tried uh, sword in one hand. Um, I, I haven't really dabbled much in rapier. I have to be honest, I took like two classes ever. That's about it. Um, but there's just something about the aesthetics of the long sword um, and just the feel of that hand and a half sword. Um, I love it. it. I will probably just always fall back to the long sword. Um, I think that's good for today. Oh, there's one thing I also want to talk to you about. And I think what, let's table the Medieval Times talk for later. Um, sure. maybe I, I think, I think it'd be good to, to, we could talk specifically about like theatrical stuff and also about that. I get, uh, um, we should probably take a little break before we do this, this meeting with Getty. But the one thing I wanted to mention today, cause I just saw the news, you know, the part of the problem with what, learning what we're learning is you think to yourself, well, you know, you can pressure test it in a, in a, uh, in a tournament and free play, but I mean, no one's, you know, winging sharp swords at each other so you can be skeptical of whether your pressure test works or not but what's happened in the news recently i think this happened yesterday uh -oh, some, I'm not dude, some crazy human uh ran at two police people with an arming sword and i think they had multiple daggers like they threw a dagger and hit one of the police people in the face and they shot and killed this guy <laughs> <laughs> wow okay and it was i mean it was like a i mean i don't know how high quality it was but it was, it was like a you know 10th or uh, yeah 10th century like looked like a norman 33 inch sharp arming sword <laughs> so and and actually again I, I work in security in los angeles and i use this citizen app that will you know kind of little you know dots of orange or red will you know appear over the la area which if you're a neurotic person do not buy this citizen do not sorry do not, do not download the citizen app you will think that the world is just going to murder you um it's like oh there's a fire oh there's a murder oh there's a gunshot it's like mm. but um more than once i've seen on this app it's like person with sword okay. dealing, like face down with cops so we think we I won't ever have to use this stuff but maybe we will <laughs> Given the state of things. couple years, some guy with a sword makes it into the news. <laughs> I mean, they're already making the news. Just a question of like how, you know, how crazy is the event? How big, you know, how spectacular or an insane or, you know, or dramatic is the thing? Like, it, <laughs> things yeah. might be a little closer to the Middle Ages than we thought. <laughs> Especially in 2020, right? <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah. We're, I mean, we're, we have what five months left? Uh, five and a half months left. You know, we we might be in Mad Max land by December. Who knows? We might so, be. We might so be. sharpen <laughs> your stuff and uh, you know limber up. Um, oh, the one other question. Um, like, uh, I mean, you're obviously you know at the you know one side of the distribution for this question, but I mean, physical fitness wise, how often are you training? Are you doing two a days, or do you just train once a day? I just do, um, actually I do uh, three days on, one day off. Um, I used to actually train daily and that's really hard on your body. And mm. actually- For use, recovery, uh, you mean? For recovery, yeah. And especially depending on how you're training. So um, I should be specific. Right now I am training primarily in, in strength training, um, bodybuilding and powerlifting. Um, and so I, 
probably should do more cardio than I do. Um, but uh, I'm lifting, so a breakdown would be like chest and, and triceps, back and biceps, legs, and then shoulders um, on the same day. Don't ask about that split. It's kind of an odd one. Um, then I take a day off and then I go back and then I do a, a set two of that. So like different exercises, but training those same body parts. And then I go back through that cycle. Um, and that seems to work really well. Um, I think you have to figure out what your body needs for training and recovery. If you're doing a lot of high intensity interval training, um, you know, you really do need to make sure that you're taking enough time off. If you're doing a lot of sparring, sparring is really hard on your system metabolically. Um, and this is a little bit where my, uh, my medical background actually comes in. So um, I've alluded to it. So I'm a veterinarian, but uh, I just finished a residency in sports medicine and rehabilitation. Um, a lot of my focus is on orthopedics, but it's also on um, uh, exercise physiology. So uh, looking at muscle building, muscle breakdown, um, metabolic recovery, nutrition, it, it all plays a really important role. So that's, that's kind of a whole discussion in and of itself. Um, sure. When I was training for martial arts and, and riding primarily, um, I was doing a lot more calisthenics. I was doing a lot less strength training. Um, I've always loved weightlifting though, and I think it's really important to be strong because it helps you to have good core and good structure. Um, and, and, uh, and so now that I just am not training in those other disciplines as much, I've just kind of shifted my focus more to that strength training because it's something that I can work into my daily routine, even when I've, I've got very limited time. So sure. That's... And, uh, ha have you found, cause again, you've, you've, you've made it, you know, extremely dramatic progress in terms of strength training. Has your range of motion been affected by this? Um, a little bit. I probably, uh, you know, can't can't quite reach my back the way that I used to. Be oh, able to. stop um, showing off. <laughs> but <laughs> um, yeah, I I think maybe a little bit. Like I my hamstring flexibility, I used to be able to put my forearms on the ground, um, and now I can just put my hands flat on the ground. So it's not like I I went from being some limber gymnast to being you know some bulky luddite. Uh, sure, you know. but. Um, yeah, I, it does affect it a little bit. And I think, you know, I have good structure, I have good balance, but am I as fast as I used to be? Probably not. Um, am I as flexible? Probably not. Is my endurance as good? Eh, it's questionable, because that's not what I'm training for. Um, sure. So I, I think you do have to adjust your training based on your goals. Absolutely. Um, I think that's good for today. Thank you so much for your time. We went actually a bit longer yeah. than I expected, but like this was spectacular. It's, it's, it's so great to talk to you again. It's like I didn't, you know, I, I hadn't really asked you about sort of how you came to this thing in the first place. And I mean, and we'll talk about this later, but it's, it was also like be, because of my work schedule, it was, it, it, I, I kind of, I, ca I kind of kept CSG at arm's length in a way because of how difficult it was to reconcile the schedules. And I think also because of because I was a you know medieval times meathead, I'm sure CSG or, or a number of CSG folks kept me at arm's length for the same reason. Um, mm -hmm. But it was but I'm still so glad that we got to catch up about this and you know and, and thank you for your expertise. Like uh, it, I don't know how um, martial arts could incorporate more people doing equestrian stuff. But if there's if there's a way to do it, we'll need you know as many people who know what they're doing as we can. So yeah, um, well, and you know, actually, your timing is somewhat fortuitous in that um, I I'm going to be moving a lot closer to the RMSG here in the next couple months. My schedule is actually freeing up a little bit since I'm moving into private practice out of academia, finished my residency, and so I'm really hoping to actually find my way back to to Western martial arts to HEMA. Um, and it's going to be a little bit of a process and, you know, figuring out my, my life here, but I really do want to make a comeback. So this was, this was actually excellent timing because it's really been at the forefront of, of my thoughts and how I want to be spending my free time moving forward. So I'm glad to hear it. it. Wait, does, does R, does RM, uh, SG, do they do Fiori? Yes. So they're actually a now sister school. It used to be daughter school, now sister school of the Chicago Swordplay Guild. And they, okay. they share curriculum. Um, and then Douglas Wagner uh, has been doing a great deal of work and really developing their program 
um, even further or, or separately even from the, or, um, from the CSG, even though they work very closely together. So um, they have a, an amazing program. They've really grown as a school. They moved into their own space a couple of years ago uh, now, um, like actually rent their own space instead of having to lease, you know, from some other group. Um, which is amazing. And so I, I'm just super excited about the prospect of, of making my way back that way. Cause I do still have some really good friends in that, um, in that group and, and they're doing some good work. So yeah. Well, I can't wait to hear about it later. Um, okay. So thank you so much, Teresa. Thank you, Dr. Wendland. <laughs> is it, is it, does it feel good to be called doctor? I, well, I've been doctor for four years now, so. I, you've grown used, you've grown accustomed to a certain, a certain lifestyle, I see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I'm just finishing the residency, but I, uh, I finished that school um, over four years ago now. Yeah, so, awesome. thank you. Well, All right, well, it was so awesome you. connecting with you. So good seeing you. Um, and we'll have to catch up again soon. Um, don't let so much time pass. Absolutely. Okay. I'll talk to you soon. And uh, I, I should talk to you before your, your wedding, but in any case, you know, congratulations and fingers crossed that it goes as smooth as it can. I know how stressful it would be. So like be well and congratulations to you both. Truly really a pleasure. Thank you. Take care. All right. Bye -bye.